Hello, good afternoon and welcome to this AHDB Tree Fruit Technical Day, which is brought to you this year uh, by a virtual go-to webinar. Those of you who have attended this event in the previous uh, years will know that we've congregated at the Orchards Event Centre at East Malling, but we can't do so this year. But actually, there's uh, a silver lining in all of this because we've got a vast number of people who have registered more than ever before for this event. And I can tell you we've got people from as far afield as Plymouth in the southwest of England, Inverness in the north of Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. Uh, and I think a Scandinavian country too. So you are all very welcome this afternoon. My name's Scott Traffel. I I'm work for the AHDB as a knowledge exchange manager for fruit crops and I will be chairing this afternoon's event. So why are we here today? Well, um, AHDB funds a number of research projects on the tree fruit industry. And the purpose of today's event is to bring you up to date with some of the latest results and information that we've got coming out of both our funded projects and those from uh, further afield, some EU funded projects as well. Um, I'm just going to take you through some of the housekeeping rules now. Um, I think you will know by now, if you've been on webinars before, that all attendees are muted. So you can hear us, but we can't hear you or see you. Um, but don't worry, there is an opportunity for you to get involved. Uh, on the right hand of my screen here, um, you can see a little mock-up of the control panel, which is available to you. Um, you can see here where my cursor is, uh, there's a question bo box. You can click on that and you can insert your own question, type that in, submit it to us, uh, and we will. Uh, I will make sure that the questions are read out at the end of each presentation. Um, I can also tell you that we have got Rob Saunders with us today, who is our tree fruit panel chairman at AHDB, and Rob is going to also assist me uh, and deal with some of the questions and put uh, some of the results into context for you. So um, the recording itself, this is a live recording and uh, it will be made available. So for those of you who can't listen to all of it today, or if you've uh, got colleagues or friends uh, or neighbours who want to listen and, and watch the webinar, it has been it has been recorded and you will be able to watch it. We will hope to have it up on our AHDB Horticulture Events Archive page, hopefully sometime later next week. Now, I think before you uh, joined this, this, this lunchtime, um, you may have been prompted to fill out your basis uh, contact or your basis registration details or Neuroso details. Um, if you haven't yet done so, you can still do that um, by, uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 an option for you to do that on this control panel. If you're still not able to do that, you can submit your uh, basis or Neuroso details to my colleague in our events team, maya.kotecha at AHDB. Dot org dot uk or uh, if you forget her details, send them to me, scott.raffle at ahdb.org.uk. So that's how it's going to work today. So what have we got? We've got two sessions for you. The first session starts now uh, and the second session will start at quarter past three. So there will be a break in between. We've got a lot of stuff to get through. Um, I'm going to kick off uh, with uh, a talk about our, our project TF223, which I'll speak about shortly. But in addition, in the first session, we've got Marjana Lipska, who will talk about the Plum Demonstration Centre. Matt Pat Rupa will talk about endophytes for canker control. Sophia Bellamy will be dealing with biocontrol of brown rot and stone fruit crops. Shang Ming Zhu on uh, an EU funded project into soil amendments for tree fruit. And then Chris Cook will bring it to a conclusion with a talk on soil resilience to improve tree health. And then we'll break for a quarter of an hour and then we'll re reconvene for the second half. So I, I am the first speaker, so we'll kick off. Um, I'm going to talk to you about TF223. This is an AHDB project which was funded for five years and it came to a conclusion in March of 2020, uh, this time last year. Um, you will have, or many of you will have heard a lot about this project in recent years at this very event uh, at East Malling. Uh, we've had numerous presentations. The purpose of me doing this is really now that we've come to the end of the project, I really want to just to pick out some of the highlights that we, we, we achieved and delivered to the industry from this. And it might also help to put the rest of the event into context too. 
So I'm going to just run through the remit of the project. Um, we dealt with a number of diseases. As I say, it was a five-year project. It was The purpose was to look at integrated pest management for both, uh, I, I should say, integrated pest and disease management uh, on tree fruit crops in general. So the diseases that we um, looked at, apple canker, which of course for many of you is, is number one enemy on your uh, fruit growing business uh, and it's always the highlight, it's always the thing that people want us to spend their money on in AHDB. Um, powdery mildew, uh, we'll cover that, apple powdery mildew, uh, bacterial canker of cherry and other diseases like brown rot of cherry. And then on the pest point front, there's codling moth and tortrix moths, which are a major problem for most growers. We've dealt with the influx of beneficial insects into newly planted orchards. Pear sucker, which again is a pest which is a perennial problem for pear growers. Anthonoma spilotus, a new weevil pest of pears. Uh, sawfly, which has been around for many years, but we're having more problems with. Uh, and um, Rhynchitis weevil, which is causing a little bit more damage in, in apples. And finally, I'll say a few words uh, about uh, surveillance work that we've been doing on new pests and diseases. So that's what I'm going to be covering. Uh, just a reminder of all the outcomes from all of these different pests and diseases. So let's kick off with apple canker. As I said earlier, a, a perennial problem and causing significant losses to uh, trees in your orchards, particularly in the early seasons after planting. And the initial work that was done at NIABMR on this project uh, developed a detection kit um, to ideally to identify the presence of the pathogen in young apple trees, possibly in the propagation phase in the nursery, but also in new young plantations. And we, we successfully delivered um, that detection uh, test. And the good thing about that is it's now being used in another project that we're funding, CP161. And that is, uh, so that, that is, uh, something that should uh, should become available at some point to you in the industry at some stage. In addition, uh, we looked at rootstocks. Uh, the question about rootstocks being, are any rootstocks, do any rootstocks or interstocks confer resistance to, um, uh, sorry, excuse me a second, um, just got held up there by something. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure everybody was able to see my presentation. I was getting a message saying that somebody couldn't. Uh, I think we're we're working correctly. Um, back to rootstocks. Rootstocks and interstocks um, uh, potentially could confer resistance to apple canker. Um, the work that we did was rather inconclusive, sadly. We looked at a number of rootstocks which are commonly used by the industry, and uh, we found that the, 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 the results were inconclusive. What we did find was that the tree vigour um, does not necessarily have an influence over the number or incidence of cankers in an apple tree. Uh, and that's something that a lot of growers have thought was uh, uh, there was a link between tree vigour and the incidence of the disease but we, we didn't find that to be the case. We also did some work looking at soil amendments uh, in newly planted orchards um, and we looked at a number of different products uh, where we incorporated these in the planting hole of the tree to see if they had any influence and we did get some good results there and we identified Trichoderma heartsianum which is sold as trianum, uh, did uh, reduce the incidence of cankers in young orchards. The bad news is it's not currently approved or registered for use in the orchard situation. It has got uh, registration uh, for uses in permanent protection, full enclosure systems. Um, so that's something we at HDB are looking at to consider whether we could work uh, with um, the manufacturers and CRD and others to see if we could find a way to get it registered for use in orchards. Um, we've also looked at uh, the Fertignect injection system. Uh, this is a system which injects an active ingredient into uh, the vascular system of a tree uh, and it successfully, uh, we, we trialled this and it success, successfully did move uh, active ingredients around the, the vascular system. Unfortunately, with all the products we tested, we didn't get any reduction in the incidence of canker, uh, which was a shame, but per perhaps further work could be done on that in, in future. Finally, we looked at um, the application of active ingredients through the Fertignac 19 uh, secateurs. Now, you can see there there's a, a small um, nozzle attached to those so that we can dispense uh, a chemical 
through the secateurs onto the cut surface of the, the branch that we're cutting or pruning in the case of apples. Um, and that did work successfully. Um, we got some very good results using both tebuconazole, which is available to apple growers and a whole range of different products, uh, and also a physical barrier called blockade. So either tebuconazole on its own or with or without blockade seemed to successfully reduce the spread and incidence of new cankers in apple trees. Now, I know um, the, the approval status of products like tebuconazole is always changing, but as of this morning when I checked, uh, I understand it is approved for use on apples although different products have different approval status, so you'd need to be guided by agronomists on that um, basis, qualified agronomists. So that's apple canker. Apple powdery mildew, another major problem for growers. Um, we, we looked initially at overwintering powdery mildew. As you probably are aware, secondary mildew can overwinter in buds and then reinfect the, the tree again in the spring through new primary mildew. Um, and we looked at mycoparasites. Again, I stress a lot of this is integrated pest management work. We're looking for alternatives to traditional chemical uh, products. Um, we looked at some mycoparasites and the plan with that was to target overwintering buds to see if we could um, somehow incorporate the mycoparasites into the buds so that when they broke in the spring, we could get control of the overwintering mildew. Unfortunately, that was unsuccessful, um, but perhaps that's something that could be revisited in future work. But um, the thrust of this big project was to look at alternatives to conventional fungicides. And I, um, Angela Berry at IRBMR, who did all of this work, has presented many of these results before. I'm only going to briefly pick out the highlights. But what I'm emphasizing with this work was these, these products that we are looking at, these alternatives, are not uh, crop protection products. Uh, the majority of them are not. They are there as uh, substances to improve tree health, to make the tree more resilient to uh, infection from a, a pathogen. So we looked at two or three of these. We looked at Cultigrow, uh, which is a biostimulant product, which is designed to try and again, improve the tree's resilience to uh, infection from other diseases. And we looked at two other products, Trident, which is a silicon-based product, and Mantrac, which is manganese, uh, based product. So as I say, not crop protection products, not approved for that use, but there to try and help improve the tree's resilience. And we also looked at products offering a physical barrier like SB Plant Invigorator, which I believe is approved for use on apples, uh, and uh, the adjuvant Wetsit. So what did we do with all of these? Well, um, we combine these with conventional fungicides by switching each week. So we do a, a conventional fungicide one week and then a different uh, a, a non-conventional alternative product the next week. And when we combine these over the course of a season on commercial uh, plantations of Gala and Brayburn, we actually successfully um, or, or we achieved similar results of control of powdery mildew to a conventional seven day fungicide program. Now, all three of these pr programs that we uh, assessed used SB Plant Invigorator applied alone. It's, uh, it shouldn't be applied with other products. But we looked at three products, uh, three, three treatments. The first was Cultigrow plus Wetsit, and we applied that uh, uh, once per month, and then a fungicide, and then we alternated the fungicide with Mantrag. Then we also use Cultigrow plus Wetsit again once a month, but we, instead of using Mantrack, we use Trident uh, every second week during the week, month. And then finally, we use just Mantrack or Trident alone, alternating with uh, conventional fungicides. Um, and the result was that the standard seven day conventional fungicide gave the best early season control. But by July, all of the three alternative programs, which I mentioned just now, the, the Cultigrow programs and the Mantrak uh, Trident ones, performed just as well as the standard seven-day fungicide. So Angela Berry's summary of all of that was that if you, uh, it's probably safest to start with conventional fungicides for the first few sprays, but by later in the season, you may well choose to reduce the number of applications of fungicides that you make. So hopefully um, that's useful. I think uh, in discussion with some agronomists that I've spoken to in recent months, some growers and agronomists have been trying to, to use some of these alternative approaches to try and increase the tree's resilience to attack. And uh, I'll be interested to know if uh, what, what, what the uh, findings were. So effectively, there is potential to reduce reliance on conventional fungicide products. So that was a, these were the main findings from the powdery mildew work.
We also focused on bacterial canker and brown rot in cherry. Um, some of you may be aware that a, a previous DEFRA funded hot link project identified a screening trial for brown rot control products, identified a coded product which was effective and uh, that's work that we've been looking at to try and seek an approval for that. But in addition, interestingly, that we found in this work um, that the SWD, spotted wing drosophila hygiene measures that we employ, were having a significant effect, a positive effect on incidence of disease. And of course, as most of you know who have suffered from spotted wing drosophila, the guidance there is to remove all old, damaged or overripe fruits, diseased fruits from a plantation, both from the trees and from the orchard floor. And if you can do that, of course, you significantly increase the hygiene within the orchard. And that was also having a beneficial effect on reducing the level of brown rot. We'll hear a bit more about brown rot later on. Bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are naturally occurring antimicrobial agents. Uh, and uh, Matt, Pat Rupar at IBMR has done quite a lot of work with these and has shown that they are, do offer activity against bacterial canker, both in the laboratory and in a field trial we showed that or demonstrated that uh, it reduced the population of canker by bacterial canker by 90 percent. Obviously, there's a registration uh, issue with that. It's not, it's not an approved process at the moment, and it's something that we'll have to look at. We'll have to work with industry and others to see if that's something that could be registered for use in future. And the final point I wanted to bring about uh, regarding uh, bacterial canker is that we found in practice the extra use of uh, polythene covers. Most of you are protecting cherries in the UK these days, but by extending the period of covering from the pre-blossom period right through until leaf fall, uh, which is longer than you would possibly normal ha normally have these trees covered for. Um, that appeared to uh, reduce the speed of spread of infection of canker in orchards which were already infected. So if you're not already doing that, that may be something that you might consider doing. Codling and tortrix moths. Well, codling and tortrix moths are uh, a common problem for apple growers. And we know that the populations uh, carry over each winter into the next season. And it's always difficult to reduce those populations down to zero. Um, we've looked at a sex pheromone mating disruption system, RAK3 plus 4, which is uh, produced and sold by BASF. And uh, that's a, a sex pheromone mating disruption system, which we trialled on orchards in Kent and in Herefordshire. And we did find similar control of codling and tortrix compared to conventional programs. So there was success there, but, and there is a but, the control was incomplete. So um, the guidance, uh, it, when I say incomplete, there were still, slow, again, small populations overwintering at the end of the season. So the, the advice is you still have to continue to monitor for the, these pests and use additional sprays if the pests exceed the damage thresholds. So I think the, the, the outcome of this is RAK3 plus four does work, but it will not give you complete control and you do have to keep monitoring and use alternative products as necessary. In addition to RAK3 plus 4, we looked at a mix of predatory nematodes, Steinonema carpocapsa and Steinonema feltiae, and we found that uh, they um, did actually were effective uh, against the um, larvae, but less so against the pupae. So further trials would be required before uh, uh, they could be relied upon in con con commercial situations. The other thing to point out about this work is that the RAK3 plus 4 is very specific to codling and tortrix moths. It doesn't deal with blastobasis or some other caterpillar species. And we did find in our Kent site that blastobasis was becoming a bigger problem. So I think, again, the, the, the lesson from this is if you're using RAK3 plus 4, you do need to uh, continue monitoring, not only for codling, codling and tortrix, but also for other caterpillar species. And you may well need to, to deal with those separately. I mentioned uh, earlier about enhancing beneficial insects. Well, um, many of you may remember um, that uh, in, in the past we've done work on this. Um, the, the image here that's depicted shows a brand new orchard which has been recently established and that's typical of what you would often see, a, a, a crop devoid of any extra vegetation, devoid of beneficial insects and as a result because nature doesn't like a vacuum, um, insect pests come in very, very rapidly to that. So what can we do about that? How can we deal with that differently? Well, we have set up a project with the help of six commercial growers, uh, now IBMR entomologists work with these growers, and they um, set up uh, 
a comparison between an orchard like the one you see in the picture with also um, strips of row which were enhanced with earwig refuges called wig nests, hoverfly attractants, and then wildflower strips with a whole range of different wildflower species. Um, and these were all designed to attract beneficial insects into the orchard. And then we compared, compared the traditional rows, as you see in the image, with those that were enhanced with these refuges, attractants and wildflowers. So what did we find? Well, we found that in the spring, uh, there were fewer aphids appearing. We, we did this over two, a period of two years, but unfortunately by summer that wasn't the case, but that's helpful to know in the spring. Um, in terms of predatory spiders uh, and anthocorids, anthocorids, they were abundant in the wig nests, less so earwigs, but we think earwigs do take longer to build up in number. Um, predatory spiders were the abundant arthropod found across both the, the, the trial, across the whole trial area, uh, the plots, the enhanced and the traditional plots. Um, but we found that the numbers of those were actually higher in the enhanced plots. And we also found there were significantly more hoverflies in the enhan enhanced plots in the first season. But significantly, having just spoken about codling and tortrix moths, um, there was significantly less codling moth damage in the enhanced plots in both the seasons. Um, now, we will have a talk about this later on. Celine Silva is going to talk to us about this because she's carried this work on for another year. So we'll get the latest results from 2020 from her later on. Pear sucker management. Well, uh, a DEFRA horticulture link project was done some years ago where we identified a number of predators like earwigs, anthocorids, um, uh, ladybirds, uh, predatory spiders, which would feed on pear sucker. And we also identified the fact that uh, the use of stingy nettles uh, and, and tree species in hedgerows like willow, hawthorn, hazel could actually boost the numbers of these. But what we don't know, or we weren't sure about, is what threshold of pear sucker we needed to actually take implement control measures at. So NIAB EMR entomologists worked with trained staff uh, on six different farms, and they trained them to identify and record sucker eggs, nymphs, and adults, as well as the natural enemies. And they then uh, responded to NIAB EMR and provided EM NIAB EMR with the counts that they were getting each week and the resulting damage. And as a result of collecting all of that data, um, our NIAB EMR identified the fact that where there are less than 1,000 sucker eggs per 30 shoots per week, but more than 10 natural enemies per 30 shoots per week, then sprays can be avoided. So that is a good um, rule of thumb that growers can now use or agronomists can now use to decide whether or need not they need to um, apply a spray to control pear sucker. Anthonomus spilotus uh, has become a bigger problem in some pear orchards in Kent. Um, this was picked up by Nigel Jenner and his agronomy team at Avalon Produce. And those, uh, th that team worked very closely with the entomologists at NIAM at NIA BMR to try and understand and little, learn a little bit more about what damage the pest was doing. The trials demonstrated that only one out of a cluster of six flowers were being damaged. And given that normally with conference, only around about three to four flowers or fruits actually set on a single truss, that level of damage, one out of six, is perhaps not economically significant. But they also found that this pest can damage up to 60% of new leaves during the growing season. So there may be a need still to control this pest for that reason. Uh, we identified that thiocloprid and spruzit um, offered most effective control, whereas gazelle and hallmark offered 50% control. Sadly, as you know, thiocoprid uh, calypso has, has been discontinued, is not now available to the tree fruit sector, and spruce it, I understand, is no longer approved as we speak. But my colleague Adam Doxford is doing is working away to try and see if he can secure uh, authorizations for that in future. Apple fruit rinkitis weevil is another pest that's become more of a problem since the loss of broad spectrum insecticides in apples. Um, so if we could identify a sex pheromone for this pest, it would help us to identify when the pest appeared in the orchard and we could monitor it more caref carefully. Sadly, attempts to do that uh, failed, but we did realise or recognise and found out that the weevils do enter the orchards in cultivars when bud scales are starting to show and first visible. So that may help growers to give you, identify a window of opportunity when you might deploy control measures, both pre-bloom and after petal fall, when the females are still likely to be laying their eggs. 
Apple Sawfly, um, another pest which has become more of a problem with the uh, loss of broad spectrum insecticides. Um, and similarly, like Apple fruit rachitis weevil, we try to identify a sex pheromone. Um, but try as she might, Michelle Fountain at NIIBMR struggled with this, and I can I can just uh, or I can give you evidence by saying that every time I walked into her office for a period of three years, she had pupae which she had collected from commercial orchards in her office. She tried them at home. She tried them in her shed. Could she uh, rear adults? No, she couldn't. Um, so it, it wasn't possible to identify a sex pheromone. But that needs to continue to to, to happen in future. So the search goes on. And finally, surveillance of emer emerging pests and diseases. Well, we, we've in this project, we continue to monitor pests like forest bug, which was identified as a, an emerging pest, and also the brown marmorated stink bug and a num number of other species such as uh, green citrus aphid and so on. Um, and uh, we, we wanted to continue the surveillance because obviously it's important for growers to understand when new pests are appearing so that we can, it can trigger some research from AHDB to find solutions. So that concludes my presentation. I think I'm just on time, maybe going, gone over uh, just very, very slightly. Um, so um, are there any questions out there? Well, uh, I shall just open up uh, my question box and we can have a look. Uh, I, I did um, explain to um, you earlier on that we've got Rob Saunders with us today, Tree Fruit Panel Chair, uh, and Rob has been has taken great interest in uh, the work that we've been doing. Good afternoon, Rob. Good afternoon, Scott. Um, Rob, I don't think there are any specific questions uh, from my presentation there, but you might just want to put that five-year project into context. How useful do you think has that been for the industry? The, before, before we kicked off that project, um, the research landscape was characterised by uh, a, a large number of, of sort of small projects, short duration, and uh, this was the first of a new t a new style of research uh, project, which encompassed a whole a whole range of different uh, different problems that we see in the orchards, um, and its continuity. That's the the span has enabled researchers to carry on digging away at some of the intractable problems that uh, that growers face. Um, I. I, I I thought your story about um, uh, Michelle's efforts to uh, rear apple sawfly through so that she could get pupae was was particularly um, you know relevant in this area because it's only by having r longer projects with a with a significant span that it gives gives researchers the capacity to actually carry on digging and digging uh, trying to find the answer to some of these intractable problems. OK, thank you, Rob. We do have one or two other questions. I'll just deal with those very quickly. Uh, Rob might be able to answer. I can answer some of them. Rob can maybe help me. Um, we've got one here on plum fruit moth control. Was there any work done on plum fruit moth control? The answer to that is no, not in this particular project. But we are aware of the issue about plum fruit moth con uh, control. And my colleague Adam Doxford is uh, beavering away trying to uh, uh, release new products which can control plum fruit moth. So we are aware of that at AHDB and we are dealing with it. Another question here is, Rob, you can maybe answer this one. I think I know the answer. Will RAK3 plus 4 control light brown apple moth uh, or uh, summer fruit tortrix species? Uh, I don't think it would do light brown apple moth. Can you confirm that? Uh, yeah, it's very, it's quite, quite specific. Um, so no, unfortunately, it won't do light brown apple moth. But you're, I mean, you said in uh, when you were running the slides, the real problem actually turned out to be, um, turned out to be buster basis. Um, yeah. And that's that's interesting because a few years ago when we were um, trying to run some experimental orchards without using broad spectrum insecticides, after a while that was the thing which became which became the issue. So I think further work required on working out how we can how we can control blaster basis. Okay. Quite a difficult one to monitor for because it just mines around the fruits the fruitlets uh, around the, the stalk end. Uh, and unless you move the clusters around, you won't, you won't, if you, you won't find the pest. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Just two more, and then we'll move on. Quick question here on any news on possible biofungi or other predators against apple sawfly. Certainly not within that project. I don't know, Rob. Have you got any knowledge? I should say, Rob is not only our tree fruit panel chair, but he works for Hutchinson's uh, as uh, an agronomist and crop protection specialist. So, Rob, um, any any knowledge on this? No, not at the um, not at the moment. 
I think some um, of the exercise in development will will have activity, but um, but we're um, that's a problem at the moment. Okay, uh, and uh, there's a final question here, but I'm not. I'm going to defer this one. If Scott and Rob could invest in future research and tree fruit, where would they focus? Um, well, that's something that we can discuss uh, in future. Um, I should say that one of our audience today is my colleague. Uh, Rachel McGauley, who is our research manager for all fruit projects at AHDB. My job is to disseminate the results. Rachel will be busily um, scribbling lots of notes today. So um, I'm sure Rachel will make a note of that final question. Um, so I think we'll, we'll bring that to a close now. Rob, thank you for now. Um, we shall speak to you again, hopefully. Um, and I'm now going to introduce our next speaker. I've done plenty of talking for, for one session. Um, our next speaker is Marjena Lipska. Um, Marjena is uh, known to some people in the industry, but perhaps not all. She's worked in the industry for many years, both at Angus Soft Fruits and James Hutton, Hutton Institute in Scotland. Uh, more recently has been at NIA BMR since 2013 and assisting and heading up some of the breeding programs on raspberries, cherries, rootstocks for apples and pears. And more recently, she's got involved with the Plum Demonstration Centre. Uh, many of you will recall this time last year that we had a presentation given by Julian Lacour. Julian, who set the, the plantation up, has moved back to his native France. And we now have the benefits of Marjena's skills managing the Plum Demonstration Orchard. She's going to tell us some of the findings that we got from that this year. Marjena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, uh, for a nice introduction of myself and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I just would like to show you a little bit of Plum Demonstration Centre, uh, what we have been doing in 2020. Uh, I would like to address, uh, even though I will be the only person who is going to speak today, but this is a double act with myself and Karen. Karen is the person who actually is doing a 90% or even 95% of work of uh, Plum Demonstration Center. She's the person who is the expert of this project. So just very briefly and quickly, just to update you what it happened during the 2020 season. So we've started in uh, beginning at the beginning of the March and it was with the plantings of the season extension trial. We are calling this a uh, season extension trial. So what we are going to look at this one is that we've planted several uh, known varieties heritage varieties as well as new varieties that we would like to see uh, if uh, any potential of the extensions of the season could be uh, made within the uh, plum uh, industry, within the plum industry. As well, it will include uh, our NIAP EMRs to advanced selections. One is very early selection, which you might be aware of, and the other one is a little bit later. Uh, that we actually planted under the tunnel area, which I will be speaking uh, a little bit about this trial later on. Uh, in early April, we've started to um, blossom thinning and we uh, on established training systems, which will be uh, later on introduced to you who don't know, and with the electrofloor uh, handheld blossom thinner. So we were aiming approximately for 33% of total blossom to remove. Uh, the pruning, uh, you can see on the picture, that's the, when the blossom thinning, it happened uh, with the electrofloor um, uh, handheld. Uh, but at the uh, beginning of April as well, we've started a pruning and it, we finished at the end of, uh, at, at the beginning of May. A light secondary pruning was carrying out uh, during the season when needed. Uh, as well, the summer pruning was carried out early July just to uh, give a little bit more sun to our fruits. Uh, root pruning, only this year we've managed to carry it out on a pan system. Unfortunately, we uh, don't have a comparison within the root pruning and non-pruned non roots um, uh, actually data, but we will be looking this into 2021, definitely in the season. And then harvest began uh, on the 5th of August and finished 
um, later on during the season. So uh, fruit quality assessment was carried out uh, only on the 50 fruits per treatment, which I will explain to you how many treatments we had in a second, and then cover crop within the new varieties area, which I've just mentioned, was plowed um, in late September, and wild flower mix was sown uh, that bespoke project, which uh, Celine um, might a little bit to talk about this later on as well, just to encourage our beneficial insects. Then uh, we've started at the beginning, we've started in early uh, uh, in the year, in 2020, with the mechanical weeder. Uh, we had a little bit of problems later on to continue to, to do so, as with the combination uh, of um, not having uh, enough staff to actually to carry out and focus on this, but we've, uh, we continued uh, to actually to control the weeds with herbicides and some streaming uh, during the, the rest of the season. Uh, just to quickly, just to show you approximately within the mechanical weeder, you can do the, within two uh, to three hours, we, you can do a half a hectare, which is which is not uh, much time consuming as such. The only time consuming thing is just to set up uh, the whole system to, to do the work. And we will be reviewing this uh, very shortly that we can possibly uh, to use this system in 2021 system, season that we can present next year to you uh, better data on it. Uh, just a very brief, uh, just for you uh, as a growers or uh, agronomists, we just would like to say what we've been using during the 2020 uh, season as a pest and disease uh, and as well her uh, herbicides and nutrition you know, system as such. So I'm not going to go through as such uh, what exactly we were using because we can read, but uh, that's what actually we've done. Then uh, coming into the training systems uh, trial. So the project uh, which actually we are doing with AHDB, which I'm talking about, is an exploitation output from uh, IUK project, which was from 2015 to 2019. The, uh, the main aim and the purpose of the project was just to maximize uh, the light interception and to have as high marketable yield and as, as the biggest yield as possible within the plant pr production. Uh, we've used, uh, or we are using still, four rootstock and we uh, on different, and four different trainings. Uh, system, so that will give us uh, as 16 treatments. The variety which we used is only for Victoria and it's not a replicated trial, uh, just the one block per, per um, treatment and then 10 trees per block. Uh, that, in, that gives us a whole two rows of the trial. Uh, in um, As well uh, to inform you uh, at the same time we planted two novel systems uh, which just what we wanted to see if this is going to work uh, you know alongside with the, the systems that were uh, highly used uh, all over the world and this is a fun and candelabra but on this one we've just used victoria a variety on san julian rootstock and is 37 trees per each um, system and is one row per each system. Just to uh, show you how the training system we were trying to aim and we were actually structuring our trees to uh, is that with the first four, which I'm actually going to mainly focus on, on because we've got the most data up to date, uh, is was planted in 2015. And as I've mentioned before, in four different rootstock, uh, four different treatment, four different training systems. The first picking on those uh, training systems it, we've managed in 2017, still under IUK project, and then ongoing uh, assessments were 
have been done. In 2020, unfortunately, the training system on BVA rootstock have been grabbed. Uh, we've, we've had a problem with severe canker, and that's on narrow A-frame and narrow tabletop. Then those uh, a little bit novel uh, training systems, they have been planted at the same time as the other four, but the first picking we've done in 2019. So I've got a little bit limited data uh, to this moment when I'm speaking to you. So uh, a little bit of graphs, uh, just to show you if we found any differences between uh, our training systems. So that's the effect on, of the training system on the fruit size uh, and uh, weight. As you can see, it's not a, it's no uh, significant uh, differences between uh, the training systems on the size, on the weight is not much neither. Uh, please, at the moment, just do not concentrate on candelabra and fan. That's a little bit different trial than the other ones. It's just to, for uh, visual effects and just to show you a little bit on this. And then the effect of training systems on the brakes and firmness, which is uh, a little bit more interesting. Uh, you can see the influences, uh, like for example, on the brakes, you can see that a little bit more uh, a little bit less um, breaks was on a, a narrow tabletop uh, training system, but the firmness is actually very interesting. You can see the most uh, influences on the firmness within the training system. So, and that's the quick, and just to show you in the table, what the mean fruit traits we've actually gained in 2020. And as you can see, that is, uh, is firmness is a one of the, uh, that is actually standing out uh, within the training systems as a characteristics. And you can see that narrow A-frame was the least on the breaks, on the firmness, sorry, pardon. Uh, just a very quick summary on this is uh, no variation was observed on the fruit size and weight. Uh, although no, 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 neither significant differences have been observed uh, within the training systems on the fruit bricks, but the firmness was least great on a uh, narrow A-frame system. Best performance on fruit firmness and weight, and weight was observed on candelabra and fan system, and it will be analyzed after 2021 system, system, season. We will inve investigate this one uh, further. Uh, after 2021 season. The, now, just uh, within the same trial, uh, I would like to show you a little bit of effect of the rootstock instead of, of the training system on the fruit size and weight, and the same will be in a minute on the uh, breaks and the firmness. And as you can see, uh, is within the uh, weight is a is we've got a significant differences and san julian is still performing the best and within the size again is performing the best then the, the effect on the rootstock on the bricks and the firmness again on the san julian we've uh, gained the best firmness although when it's coming into the bricks, it wasn't performing the, the highest as such. So uh, coming into the total yield, uh, as I said, uh, we removed the candelabra and the fan from this uh, because that would need to be actually compared only to St. Julian because that's what we've got only on. But uh, just to show you visually, that uh, on a, within the training system and within the rootstock, what we actually gain as a fruit yield ton per hectare. And you can see on this that VBA uh, on an oblique system, it was the, the best performance. So a very, very quick summary on those one on rootstock trial is no significant differences have been as such observed on uh, fruit bricks. In fruit size, uh, it's no big differences as such observed, 
but the best route firmness and weight was achieved on uh, St. Julian and Wabit. The highest yield was observed on VPA oblique system, as I've just showed you, and the second best on Wabi narrow uh, A-frame. Uh, then, uh, unfortunately, VPA, uh, VPA rootstock, it showed that on other two, if I will come back one slide um, before, that we had to remove, as I mentioned before, we had to remove. So we don't know how the narrow tabletop or narrow A-frame uh, can perform on VBA. Uh, although I don't think you would be uh, that keen to grow on VBA. Anyway, only assessments on uh, the one thing, what I would like to mention, the only assessment uh, fruits were graded. So it, the, grade, it, the grading was based on the 50 fruits. As well, no first or neither second class uh, were recorded in 2020, but that will change in 2021. So we will have a much better data to present for you next year. So now uh, into moving very quickly into a protection uh, trial. So as you can see, uh, we've got four tunnels and four tunnels are actually unprotected, even though on the picture you can see that tunnel number three has got a, a plastic on. It was removed before a season started. So uh, we've planted uh, as well Victoria, uh, one row each uh, tunnel, and it's on the rootstock Wabit. Uh, then training system we've chosen is a super spindle and then two rows per tunnel when one is Victoria and is a fully planted. But then we uh, wanted to actually to see the performance of uh, advanced selections of NIA PMRs, a uh, breeding program. And we uh, unfortunately, we had a limitation into propagated trials, uh, propagated trees. So uh, you can see that in 2020, we were able to, uh, to plant uh, 26 or 30, tre 30 trees per row in uh, one or another uh, tunnel. So then the tree spacing is uh, 1.2 meter and row spacing 2.7. Uh, trees per hectare, with, with, you can manage 3,000. So we've started harvest uh, uh, on 5th of August and finished on uh, 17th of August. And as as I mean, as I'm uh, written, as I written is on 2020 first yield we've obtained only on Victoria because we just planted our advanced selections. Just a very quick. Uh, show of size and weight again, uh, but the effect of the covering on Victoria's fruits. So as you can see, is uh, under the cover, it was greater uh, size than uh, uncovered. And then uh, on the weight is, you can see is the same situation. So with the covering, you can gain uh, size and the weight of the fruits. With the bricks, uh, as well as the size and uh, weight, but the firmness, which could be uh, a bit expected, uh, and it might be due to that, uh, we, we might need to pick a little bit earlier, the firmness is lower than uh, under cover, uh, uncovered uh, trial. So just to uh, summarize what we are planning this year and what I've mentioned before as well, that we will continue on the training systems and rootstock trials uh, that we will uh, add into this year, another year into the data that we can produce a much better um, uh, pro like, uh, you know, outcome and reports for you to know which actually the training system and the rootstock might be the best. And this year we will, as I mentioned, we will include the first and second fruit classes. In under the protection trial, uh, definitely we will be picking Victoria, as we know that it should uh, fruit this year, and uh, NIAP EMR selections if if they will produce, which we hope so. Uh, Fertigation trial. We will be planning very, very soon how we can do uh, so 
and then uh, we will be updating you uh, very soon on this, that one. And then, of course, we will combine the data from over the years and we will be uh, producing a nice uh, report for you to actually read through and what you can actually gain from different uh, training systems and rootstocks and possibly a new varieties or maybe uh, coming back into the old varieties. So that's pretty much me. I hope I manage within my time. I think I've done even quicker than I should so. Uh, Thank you, Mozilla. Yeah, so Thank that's, that's me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we are running a little bit behind time. I have completely blame the scientists because they've done just so much good work they want to tell us all about. Um, so it's their fault. Um, it, we've got a couple of questions come in. I can probably deal with both of them initially. Uh, one relates to um, the, the data of root pruning. Um, surprised that it was done in July. I can't say that normally root pruning would be done during the dormant season, um, but uh, I, and, and I quote, a follow-up treatment in July can increase the effect on growth control without adversely affecting fruit size. So it says in the old HDC tree fruit fact sheet on root pruning. Um, so that's what we were following. Um, but yes, it, it, we recognize it is unusual uh, to do it in July. Um, second questions relate to the covered versus uncovered trial, Marjena. Um, we do don't actually have any yield data from that yet because the trees in the covered trials are still very new, I think, aren't they? Um, so we don't have any results from that yet, but we will do as, as time goes by in future we, we years. Do, yeah, we do have a yield data, but it's definitely it's too early to actually to say if it's uh, you know, worth to cover it or not to cover. It's, it's, it was the first year where we picked. So as you can imagine, you know, the first year it might be a nicer fruits, etc. But it might be a very little one. So okay. yeah, that's why I didn't present the total yield. Thank you, Marjana. Thank you. We must move on. Thank you so much for, for taking us through that. And I would just also just reiterate, you can see more information about the Plum Demonstration Centre on our website. If you just search a, 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 um, Plum, the Plum Demonstration Centre on any search engine, you will come across it on the AHDB website. Uh, and this is ongoing work. And as, as, as the seasons progress, more information will, will build up on the, from the centre. So we, we will be seeing you again, Marjana. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Rob, um, I think we will have to move on, Rob. I'd love okay. your views on the Plum Demonstration Centre, but we're running a little bit late. So uh, let's move on. Thank you. Uh, and our next speaker uh, is Matt Pat Rupar from NIAB EMR. Um, I've talked earlier on this afternoon about uh, uh, bacteriophages. Um, Matt's going to talk about endophytes now, uh, other naturally occurring uh, microbials within orchard trees. and um, He's, going to, he's been doing some significant work on the control of apple canker and whether we can rely on endophytes to do the job for us. So, Matt, um, please tell us what you've been finding. Yeah, thank you, Scott, and good afternoon to everybody. I hope you can hear me and see my presentation. And I've decided that for this audience, I'm not going to talk about the importance of canker and how it's normally controlled, because pretty much every apple grower in the audience will know what we can currently do on the limitations of losing products and the uh, problem with the disease coming back during planting and during. So I'm not going to cover that, but I'm gonna, just going to go into um, what else we think we could do apart from chemical control and pruning that you're probably already doing. So our basic idea is that the tree is not just a plant, but it's a community. And it's a community of all different organisms that you might expect and you might not expect. So there are fungi growing in and out of the tree, or mice, bacteria, insects, and they grow throughout everywhere, in the roots, in the stems, in the leaves, in the shoots. And they can be beneficial, they can be neutral, and they can be, they can be pathogenic or detrimental to the, to the tree. And when you have a pathogen like apple canker that needs an opening in the tree to um, to invade and to cause problems, then what is already living in the tree might actually help preventing neonectria or apple canker infecting. So with that, we focused on endophytes. These are one, one type of um, microorganism that you might find in the tree and they reside within the plant tissues 
they enter either through soil and from to roots through soil they can enter through by by dispersing through air and coming in through leaves or they can even be transmitted sometimes from mother plant to um just via seeds and then in very close contact with the plant if you can imagine they live between the cells so what they do directly interact with the plant and they they can promote growth they can um, induce stress tolerance or defense sometimes and they can directly antagonize pathogens so directly control pathogens sometimes or sometimes they just don't do anything really they just wait for the plant to die so they can digest it later like as a saprophyte and our question is here can we can we make or are they resilient apple endophyte communities that will prevent um, or suppress or even prevent apple canker infection in the commercial orchards so we asked two very simple questions, relatively simple questions here, and that's what we're going to cover today. So first, are identified communities different in different apple cultivars? We know that apple cultivars can be more or less susceptible to um, apple canker, and the question is, are the endophytes in these cultivars different? And if they're different, then maybe they are part of the reason why they have, have different susceptibility to canker. And then if that is true, can we actually manipulate endophyte community in the susceptible trees to look more like what is in resistant trees and with it reduce impact of canker in the commercial setup? So for the, for the first part, when we're looking at endophytes in different apple cultivars, we set, um, we set out to do that in two commercial sites. So we have a commercially grown apple that we planted and we planted eight different scions on two different rootstocks so we have 16 different types of trees on two different sites and we focused on the community in the leaf scar you can see here in this black part for four circuits in the black part how we took the sample and we focused on the communities in the leaf scars because in uk leaf scars are leaf scars in the autumn are the main infection point so if the community in the leaf scars in the autumn is resilient or, res or resists apple canker infection, then you might have a massive decrease of infection in the next year. So we focused on that. We thought that was the best uh, point in the tree to, to focus. And we took the, the, we took the tissue and we sequenced all different organisms that are present there and compared, um, compared different scions, different sites and different susceptibilities. And we did this across two years and three different seasons, if you wish, autumn 18, spring 19, and autumn 19. And we did, we estimated the size of the community. So how many fungi and how many bacteria are there or how well these leaf scars are populated and who is there or, or, or composition. And you can see that how leaf scar community if you look at the fungi and bacteria are actually responding very different to fluctuations in the season so um, the fungal communities on the left um, on the two graphs on the left they're very similar across two different sites um, and they drop dramatically by a thousand fold so less than a percent of um, fungal community survives the winter and still there in the spring and then builds up again till then till the next um, autumn while on the right hand side the bacterial community size is just very slowly increasing or staying the same. So that means I will have the, when you apply different control measures, you 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 need to know how they're surviving and then reapply them if needed. With that, we then compared actually each point on this graph is one tree that we sampled. So we compared, this is the data from October 2018 only, and we have other data still in analysis, but we compared what is the difference between these trees that are supposedly more resistant, more susceptible in terms of bacterial and fungal communities. And um, you could see on bacterial side, they're all dots in one big cloud in the middle, and um, you have different um, colors and different shapes based on whether the dot is from resistant or susceptible apple canker variety or um, apple variety, or if it's from one side to another. So triangles are on one side and circles are all from another side. And you can see the bacteria are very similar. So there's not that much effect of resistance to canker or site on bacteria, but fungi are very different. Fungi seems to be completely different from site to site and even um, this in this uh, if you wish this um, 
um, ellipse. It's the resistant variety, Golden Delicious and Robusta 5, seem to be different in fungal on both sides, different than the rest. This is true in bacteria, but, but only for Robusta 5. You see, that's the same circle. So this is a bit complicated, so I'm just going to simplify it here. This is basically asking what factors are contributing to the leaf scar endophyte community. And from our data, we can say that the field and cyan variety contribute most to bacterial um, community sh uh, shape and fungal community shape. Interestingly, within the field location is important as well. So that means that the, bac the bacteria and fungi tend to um, be different in different parts of your plots. And susceptibility to canker had a smaller effect. What is interesting is the cyan variety had a much larger effect than susceptibility. That means that different varieties will shape different, will shape how, who can come in the tree or which organisms can, can go in the tree and which can survive in the long term. Um, so we learned how this is, how microbiomes in, are, are assembled. And then we asked, all right, but are there any fungi or any bacteria that are more abundant in the resistant cultivars? And can, can they be responsible for why these cultivars are more resistant to apple canker? And the answer is yes and no. Um, we found, for example, in fungi that are um, high, more abundant in resistant science. We found two um, genuses that are um, two fungal genuses that are associated with uh, biocontrol and plant growth promoters. But we also found two genuses that are associated, at least based on literature, literature resources and sequence comparison, that are actually associated with plant pathogens. So the actual what these strains are actually doing in there will need to be confirmed. But there is a chance that there are um, more plant growth promoting. Um, fungi and bacteria in resistant science. So what have we co concluded so far from all this sequencing and, and, and all this um, fancy science is basically that you can change your leaf scar microbiome by, by, by changing the what bacteria and fungi are present in the orchards, basically by spraying them in or applying them, you will change what is happening in the tree and that can change then canker. Um, Biocontrol or organisms that can come in the tree are to some extent um, um, affected by the genotype. So maybe not all uh, biocontrol agents will go in all different cyan cultivars that you have. So maybe we need to be careful with that. And the timing and how many times we reapply them will, will be different for fungi and bacteria. Fungi, it looks like we're going to have to reapply them every year, while bacteria, once they're in, they might be more persistent. We don't know for each exact strain if we're going to find any, but this is like on, on general basis. And we have lots of more data to come um, from the two different seasons that I haven't shown you here already, and we will be able to draw more solid conclusions. But now to the more applied part. So what is the actual biocontrol potential of these endophytes? So I said that we could find some that are more abundant in resistant cultivars compared to susceptible. And here I'm going to just present the case of one that we've done quite extensive study on already, and this is called, called Epicoccum perforations. It was found to be 10 times more abundant, roughly, in the gold delicious and grenadier versus Gall and Braeburn. So in more resilient, resistant cultivars is higher, and that is, we got this from exactly the same sequencing data that I was presenting so far. So that, that follows up from there. And then we actually isolated it locally from our trees, from a site, and we showed in the lab that it has a biocontrol against Nectria on agar plates. And which, when we checked the literature, we actually found that it has other biocontrol properties against Fusarium, Pythium, and Monolinia as well. But actually, the proof of the pudding is controlling in the field conditions, really. Does it do that? Can it do that? Can we make, can we put it in the tree and does it control? So that's what we set out to do. And the first, for endophyte, the first big question is, can we introduce it in the tree? Can we, can we amend the tree with it? Will it go in and how? So we did that on M9 rootstocks where we amended it. We used spray, drench, and combination of spray and drench um, with the spores of Epicoccum. And we did it this across two years. And we were very happy to see that um, drench, spray and drench, and spray, all three um, um, amendments 
with epicoccum increased epicoccum uh, concentration in the leaf scars and that was measured uh, about two months after we sprayed and then we checked that that those that, that epicoccum that we found was actually alive and we've isolated and we found that in the drenched spray or just sprayed we actually find the epicoccum that we put while in control there was none there now this is only unfortunately only one year of data that I'm presenting here. We have another year of data um, still waiting to be analyzed because we had a, a certain um, events in the 2020 when we couldn't really go in the lab and do all the lab analysis that we could. Um, so that was due to the pandemic. We're still waiting for the data, but this is very encouraging. But what we did got from this same trial is um, we inoculated these leaf this this um, amended rootstocks and we wanted to see whether we can prevent canker decrease canker incidence unfortunately even though we spray inoculated fresh leaf scars at leaf fall what you would get in uh, in your orchards normally we got very 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 low infection rate so if you can see a little table here of over the two years for each treatment we have about 100 to 150 um stems of rootstock that were inoculated, replanted, and then assessed, and we got infections between three and six. So this, the incidence was too low to, to actually confirm that we can control with epicoccum, apple canker, but we did got an indication that at least epicoccum doesn't seem to be um, doing any problems or any damage to the growth of the of the rootstock. So when we checked the diameter, when the rootstocks were harvested after amendment, there was no um, there was no distinct effect on the on the on the growth in 2018 or 19. So you never know with these things. They can be fine by control in the lab, but then when you when you put them in the tree, they can be pathogens. You never know, and they can decrease. And we saw no um, symptoms and no decreased um, growth or decreased diameter. So we were quite happy with that. But then we decided we need to we need to to get through to this barrier to get enough infection. So I, what I decided to do is actually co-inoculate. So take trees that are growing in the field instead of rootstocks, go on mature trees and take the leaves off and put epicoccum there together with nectria or just nectria apple canker on its own. And we did that in 2019 in the in the autumn and then monitored across to, to the summer 2020, and we got very good results. Um, we had about 60% infection rate with uh, when we just put a nectria on the leaf scars, and that was done in the field on mature gala trees um, on many, many different repeats. And when we do that together with epicoccum spores, we reduced infection rate by about 50% down to, from 60 down to 30%, which is great especially considering that I've put quite a lot of nectar spores in there straight on the leaf scar. So the competition and the biocontrol that epicoccum can do is quite high. We are, we are very happy with that. And I think with this, this, this is a potential to become a control product in the future. And the good thing is that if it's in the tree, even in a low quantity, it can still have a marginal or small effect even when you stop applying it because it's an endophyte, it lives in the tree. Now we still need to confirm whether how how this lives, um, what is the um, long-term survival of epicoccum and how well it colonizes the whole tree from the leaf scar that you infected with the biocontrol, if it colonizes the whole branch or not. It's something that we're still um, looking into, but I think this is a really important result. So with this, I'm just gonna quickly conclude what, what we sort of found out. We found out that it will be, or it sh the data looks like it should be possible to put an intervention in your orchards and change what organisms live in the tree with it. The timing of those interventions will be slightly different based on whether it's bacteria or fungi, and maybe some will be shorter lived than other. But endophytes, as we see them now, could be a huge um, could be a huge help in maybe, especially in the in the establishment phase where you would amend in the nursery. And during planting, well, you don't use much um, in terms of, uh, of fungicides yet in the first or, or less than you would, and they could have a better chance of colonizing, and that could give you a long-lasting protection then again against canker for many years to come with some reapplication. And the first 
case for endophytes to be a, a good example is this epicoccum that I presented. And we need some involvement now from industry to get this to, to the orchards. And with this, I really need to acknowledge our industry partners that were hosting the trials and helping with the planting and agronomy of the trees. Our team that did the great work on all the assessments and inoculations and spraying and all the funding from AHDB, your attention and I'll take questions if I'm not completely over. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, um, thanks for keeping to time. Um, one question for me, I suppose, is uh, what's the time scale here, uh, you know, being realistic between the work that you've done and this translating into something commercial for the industry? Are we talking five years away? Or are we talking more about more than that or less? Well, it all depends how strict um, the approval process is for something that is locally present in the in the orchards. Now, I don't I don't exactly know if it's the same for something for a strain from Australia to bring here, if it's exactly the same process as for this epicoccum strain that is from our backyard. But I would assume that it's less stringent. Probably the um, environmental concerns are still the same. You're still putting a lot of it in the environment. So the, some, some of the toxicity and ecological tests will still need to be done to get it there. And I guess the main, the main um, driver will have to be from industry to take it, a, from, from, from plant protection industry to take it ahead. Because um, we can only do so much at this stage. We can't produce it in large enough amounts to go in the, in the orchard trials. Uh, in large scale that would probably be needed to obtain um, um, approval. Okay. But it's something that um, um, commercial partners like Bayer or Belgium, they would know exactly how to do. Okay, thank you. Rob, are you still there? Are you with us? Yes, I am. I'm just going to add, Rob, just very quickly, final, final, final word to you is, do you see this as a game changer in the future? for canker and the apple industry in the uk yes completely um the range of materials that we've we've got available to us um is is very much reduced uh, we've become much more aware of the adverse impacts of copper applications on uh, soil biology so uh, the prospect of actually being able to find a biocontrol to shift the populations in our orchards and uh, and confer a degree of resistance i think is i think is really exciting it's uh, it's it's this sort of fundamental science that completely shifts the way that we think about the way that a, a, the trees and disease operates. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be an agronomist. <laughs> Great, thank you. OK, we must move on. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Matt. Much appreciated. Um, well, we're going to stay with um, biological control and integrated management of diseases, um, but we're going to move from apple canker to brown rot in stone fruit crops. Um, the collaborative training partnership uh, is a term that we often bandy around and many of you may not know what it's about. Well, it's funded by the BBSRC and its uh, ambition is to train the next generation of skilled scientists for a career in fruit research. Um, this particular CTP studentship is a fruit related one and uh, it's led by Berry Gardens Growers, but Marks and Spencer, National Association of Cider Makers, Worldwide Fruit Limited, AHDB, World Worshipful Company of Fruiters and Mid-Kent Growers are all involved <coughs> in supporting our CTP students. And we're now going to hear from one of those. Um, Sophia Bellamy is in her final year of her CTP studentship scheme. Sadly, Sophia is having problems with her camera today, so she's kindly uh, inserted a picture of herself in the front so we all know who's talking to us. Um, Sophia, tell us what you've been finding in your PhD. Uh, yes, thank you, and apologies that you can't see me today, um, but hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my PhD studentship that I'm doing, um, which is on biocontrol uh, to control brown rot on cherry. Um, so I'm just going to go um, over brown rot really quickly and uh, give a brief overview of the controls, the biological control that I'm looking at, the objectives I'm trying to achieve, and then focus on a recent study I've done into latent infection. So as many of you probably know, uh, brown rot affects um, stone fruit. There's uh, three main pathogens, which is of the monolinear species, but I'm concentrating on monolinear laxa as it's the one that 
we struggle with the most in the UK. And I'm specifically looking at cherry. Uh, so from this picture, you can see that uh, with brown rot, it can infect uh, healthy fruits. Um, it can cause rot in the field. It can cause blossom blights. And it can also cause, um, form these mummified fruits in the field, which is where the inoculum builds up over winter and then reaffects. Uh, the fruit in the spring so it's a very effective disease and one that's quite hard to control once you've got it in your field um, so the current control methods that we have are fungicides um, but as we all know um, there's a lot of restrictions and a lot of them are being um, controlled and we also have resistant strains in the field now so a lot of them aren't even working and physical control so removing of the mummified fruits that i've mentioned and post-harvest treatments but as you all know these are quite expensive and uh, fiddly jobs to do um, so i'm looking at two potential new biocontrols that we discovered in 2013 in um in the field in kent down at naya bmr uh, so they're local biocontrols and uh, they currently have been picked up by a company to formulate. So hopefully they might be available at some point in the future. So I'm going to be looking at the best way that we can use these biocontrols to help control brown rot in the field. The first thing we need to know when it comes to biocontrols is their mode of action, because this will help us inform how we use them if we know how they um, attack the disease that we're looking at. So this graph basically just explains the two different biocontrols and how they work differently to control brown rot. So we've got our B91 strain, which is a bacteria, and it's a bacillus strain, um, which you might recognize from products like Serenade. And what it does is it produces inhibitory compounds. So this graph just shows that if the living cell is present or if the cells have died off, um, as long as the inhibitory compounds are present, it can still be effective. Our Y126 is an Oreobacidium strain, which you might recognize from um, Matt's slides earlier, and it's a yeast like fungus. And this basically competes with the disease for space and nutrients, and therefore um, it needs to be alive and um, present in order to do that. So, through the whole of my PhD, um, I'm going to be looking at how these biocontrols can um, survive and grow within the field and the best way for us to use them. So the first thing I looked at was um, reducing of the overwintering. So can the biocontrols um, colonize and survive on these mummified fruits and therefore reduce the inoculum that you're achieving in spring? Um, and then can we also spray them onto blossoms? So can they uh, survive on blossoms and protect them from early infection? And then also latent infection, which I'll go into more detail in a second. And then the final thing I'm looking at is the cherry microbiome, which is basically looking at uh, the whole um, sort of microbiome of the tree and the fruit and how these are affected over time, how they're affected by the application of our biocontrols. Um, and I'll be using all the data from these earlier chapters to do that. So today I just want to briefly go over the latent infection. So what happens with latent infection? It's when the infection occurs really early on in early fruit and blossoms. And when the green fruit um, is produced, the conditions aren't very favorable for monolineal axa to kind of grow and proliferate. So it stays dormant within the fruit and you get these really lovely, healthy uh, looking fruits in the um, summer. But what will happen is as soon as they're harvested, the rot forms post harvest. Um, so seemingly healthy fruits are actually infected and we don't see it until it's too late um, because as the fruit ripens, the conditions become um, better for M. laxa and it will start to develop at the um, not the most opportune time. So I was looking to see if we can use biocontrols to apply this to the fruits and help protect them so that when they're harvested, we can reduce these post-rot post harvests. So I started off in 2009 doing a very quick experiment just to see if it was something that was feasible. 
um, I applied the two buyer controls two weeks before harvest um, and then picked the fruit, stored them and counted the rots. And from that, um, you can see that there was actually um, an effect. So the green bars on this chart is the control. So these were fruits that weren't treated and the pink and the blue are our biocontrols. So you can see on the first day um, after harvest, there was actually a reduction of up to 70% um, of rots. And by day four, there was actually 100% of rot in our fruit and a reduction of 30% on the treated fruits. Um, and I stopped counting after that just because the control was at 100%, so everything had rotted in there. Um, the reason the rot was so high is because I did purposely infect the fruits with monolineal axa and they were kept at ambient temperature so the um, storage conditions were perfect for the rot to, to form. So taking this on to the next year, I wanted to, oh, sorry, I didn't talk about my conclusion, but I said it already, 30% reduction in rot. So from the um, 2020, I took it further and just um, developed the experiment more. So I stored the cherries at four degrees, so cold storage. And then I also did two different applications. So when I infected the fruits with monolineal laxa, I had some that had been treated with the biocontrol before and some that had been treated with the biocontrol after they were infected with monolineal laxa. Um, I had a much larger sample size and I also uh, introduced fungicide and a, a lunar sensation as a control as well um, to see how it compared with um, a current control method. So from this, um, from the graph, we can see that very similar to uh, the year before, there was uh, an improvement in post-harvest rot, which is promising. So the first section is our uh, B91, the, the bacteria. And you can see here that um, it is, uh, there are less rot than the control. Um, and there's a big difference between the application time. So the B91 was better at controlling monolineal axa when it had been applied um, after the um, infection occurred. And with our Y126, um, our Oreo basidium, there wasn't much of a difference between the two application times. However, there was also still a reduction and um, the B91 was actually quite good um, if it was applied at the right time, was almost as competitive as the fungicide. Um, however, if it was applied at the wrong time, then it wasn't quite as successful. So this just goes to show that when we understand how these biocontrols work and what their mechanisms are, um, we can apply them more efficiently in the field. Um, so it's quite important to study that. Um, but to conclude, um, I can say over the two years that when you apply these biocontrols two weeks before harvest, you can see a great reduction um, in rot. Uh, for the, the Y126, the Oribasidium, it didn't matter too much um, between the timings of application, which means it is very competitive with the monolineal axa. Um, with the bacillus, uh, it's important that we get the timing of the sprays right, which means we need to include it with uh, a disease um, predictions. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is quite a promising um, initial result um, for the use of these biocontrols. Um, I've tried to go really speedily through that to get us back on tracks, but maybe there's time for some questions. And you've succeeded, Sophia. Thank you so much indeed for making it so clear. I, I, I'm sure you've derived huge satisfaction from doing this study. Um, I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. Um, and it's very exciting to get these sorts of results from a, a PhD studentship. I think you can be very proud. Um, Rob, um, standing by, um, the difficulty for us in, in these situations, obviously, is to take the great work that Sophia has done and translate it into commerce. Uh, and obviously that's something that AHDB could potentially help to do by working with commercial partners and so on. Um, but there are an increasing number of biofungicides out there being used by the industry. But I think the crucial thing, am, am I right in saying, is is this timing, which is exactly what uh, Sophia said. It's, it's trying to get um, the right time and the right conditions to make it work successfully. How much, how much experience have you had working with other such products? 
the ex experience is building all the time. You're absolutely right, Scott, that um, these all of these materials, they're slightly more difficult to use than, than the chemistry we've been used to. But as we get the as we get an understanding of uh, how we can play to their strengths, they're really contributing usefully to uh, to the programs that we're using, and uh, particularly in the run up to harvest, we're able to manage uh, manage um, residues downwards uh, by deploying the biological type materials uh, as as harvest approaches. So uh, it's a really exciting area. Okay. Um, thank you. We do have a couple of questions here. If you're still there, Sophia, we've got one for you. Okay. Um, somebody being very complimentary about our presentations today, which is thank you. Um, have you only applied treatments just before harvest and have you considered flowering applications? So I only showed the results for my applications that I did two weeks before harvest, but I do have um, other, I have done other experiments where I applied it to blossom and then I um, have what I've done with that is I've been looking at the survival rate. So I've been, I applied it at blossom and then I looked to see if it could survive on the blossom and then also if it was still present when the fruit formed, um, just to see if then we, we would have to reapply it um, after blossom. Um, I don't have that data on me, but um, as I'm in my final year, it's going to be published at some point uh, before September, so I can let you know once I've kind of crunched all the numbers. That, that would be useful. And I'm sure your uh, colleagues at NIAB AMR, where you're based, will have this information as well. So between you all, hopefully we can take this further forward. Uh, and a yes. slightly kind of related question, and this I think maybe is more for Rob than Sophia to answer. Um, is there any scope for approvals of biological control agents for application post-harvest rather than pre-harvest? Are there any out there that already have such um, uh, authorization? I'd have to check, but I think there are. Yes, I think there are. Uh, but I, I want to reiterate what you said, Scott. I think this is a highly impressive PhD. Uh, I think very, very impressive. Yeah, well, thank you, Sophia. I, I think um, we need to ensure that all the work you've done, Sophia, is uh, taken forward from here. And we perhaps at AHDB need to have discussions with you and your supervisor, Shang Ming, uh, and others about this. But uh, as I said earlier, thank you for that. Oh, we just got a couple of the last questions come in. I'll just take those quickly. Um, is there reason to believe that Serenade could assist in the same way? Um, do you want to answer that, Sophia? Um, so the serenade is a very similar um, bacteria, it's a bacillus, it's a slightly different strain, so our strain has actually been um, isolated from cherry, so it's slightly better suited um, to kind of uh, proliferate and live on cherry, um, and so we have reason to believe that we think our strain would be slightly better when it comes to cherry. Uh, I have used serenade as a control in some of my experiments, um, so in the future, I might be able to say how it compares between the bacillus and the serenade. Um, but at this stage, I couldn't say. OK, well, that's very honest and that's good news, really. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you for comment. your this questions. That Rob... Yes, please, Rob. Sorry, I was about to say this is a, this echoes a comment that Rob Storer from BASF made about a week ago that um, the, the, the origin of the strain that you're choosing seems to have a big influence on how well it survives on the uh, on the tissue and how well it colonizes um, and it's again it's it's something that you start to, we're starting to build up knowledge um, as to which which of the which of the strains fits better in, uh, in in which situation okay thank you we must wrap it up but i'll just say for, um, thank you again sophia and uh, we hope that you can find some sort of employment going forward in this uh, wonderful industry of ours so thank you for all you've done for us thank you okay so we'll move on now um still keeping with uh, tree health uh we're going to hear from zhang ming zhu i think everybody out there in the industry knows zhang ming He's been around as long as, almost as long as I have. Um, Shang Ming heads up all the pathology and crop protection work that goes on at NIAB MR. Um, Shang Ming has been dealing with an EU funded project. Um, you recall in my presentation at the start, we talked about soil amendments for apple canker control. Uh, well, Shang Ming's doing some further studies on research into soil amendments for tree fruit. Shang Ming, what have you learned? Okay, thank you, Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I go to my talk, I just simply refer to the previous question about serenade and B91. Just that we did a, 
couple of years, long as four years ago, we did a simple experiment with uh, compared B9 wild with serenade in suppressing spore spoilation of mummified fruit. The R B9 wild is much, much better than serenade. Serenade had the effect, but B9 wild is much better. But we don't know anything else about fruit effect. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just about the new plant disease, and in my whole talk, I try to really divide into two parts. First, we'll talk about the uh, key results from the recent complete BBSRC Happy project supported by BBSRC and several uh, industry partners. Uh, what are the key findings? Then I try to use the key, key findings to actually relate to why we're doing the EU work, how the EU work uh, can uh, uh, develop from the Happy funding, and what, is, what we hope to achieve. Um, then what it will actually will flow nicely to Chris Cook's talk next one, talk about the soil moment. Okay. So I hope the okay. So everyone knows what is the apple new candy there. Don't be saying anymore. The other thing is, and um, I want to stress that by current consensus about apple meat plant disease and its cause and uh, because it has been a debate for many, many years. Uh, people think it's about physiological problem. People think it's about pathology problem. Uh, some people think it's about soil condition, other issues. And um, in the end, we will last, I think, for 15, 20 years more, or less, we reach a consensus about the, the apple leaf plant disease. It's more or less agreed. And uh, this is primarily a passion problem. The problem before we had a, we have difficulty in uh, um, a certain this is a passion problem because as soon as a different species or strains that can cause a problem, the is fusarian, syndrome carbon, rastonia, phytophthora, pistium. Uh, the problem is they vary, they are relatively important, abundance vary with site, and furthermore, the lamatodes can actually. Uh, causing that makes it probably even worse by creating wounds than the pathogen can get into. And the soil amendment has demonstrated can be effective uh, against these pathogens, but not all, only some pathogen. And they clearly dem demonstrate the OMIC, which is Phytophthora and Pissim, react differently from the aggressive sweep fungal pathogen into soil amendment, a type of soil amendment. That has been clearly shown in Washington state by Mark Mazula's group in apple root plant disease in the last 10 years. We also know rootstock different in their response to ARD, but we, um, but we do not know to what extent the difference are between the rootstocks. And commonly, as the math said, and the country, the Mark Bion or Mark Rubio community is a hot topic. Everyone knows the um, soil Mark Rubio community will affect tree health, possibly indirectly or directly. And the question is can we understand the structure of the community, how that affects the apple root plant disease? So, based on that kind of uh, understanding, we successfully obtained a BBSRC Happy project. It's a horticulture and potato initiative that's called Happy. Started in 2015, supported by the uh, Scottish Government, Heineken, BBSRC, NERC, Gotham, and also Frank Matthews, and also a, a breeding um, company from Le Netherlands. So, what, what are we trying to find out is uh, what is causing problem as far as ARD is concerned. And of those uh, co possible causal agents, what are the importance of the individual ones? Do we need to control all of them? And third one is more, more poorly important for replanting site. And um, given we cannot do broad spectrum uh, fumigation, and um, we have to adopt different, each way, various different methods, each of those maybe ha may have a, par have a partial effect. One of them is rotate rootstock. If we know the rootstock differ in their response, can we actually rotate genetically different rootstock in the same site, previous site? Can that actually reduce uh, the plant disease severity? So that's three, three questions we are asking. So first question is what are causing the problem? The actual answer is pretty difficult to say because we did three or four different sites. 
where we sample the healthy trees. You can see here a very, um, a very clear healthy tree. This is very actually, apple leaf plant. This is a clear leaf plant inside. We'll sample the labeling trees, the soil, uh, right sphere soil, and labeling trees in order to reduce spatial effect. Um, what do we find? I'll start with several orchards in the UK and in Lesland. The cause of pathogen uh, primarily is pisin and selenium carbon. Those two principal ones. But, and also you, you can clearly see in the leaf plant disease tree, there's lack of, of beneficial, common beneficial organ like, like bacillus, pseudomonas, mycorrhiza, everything. The problem is the exactly which species is reduced or increased very very greatly with the site you we are sampling we were sampling so essentially we know the common pathogen we know the common um beneficials uh, do are associated with with ard but the rate importance uh, is not fixed which is very with site okay so the question i'll ask okay given we know that everything is important maybe given the site uh we don't know which causes uh, ard can we see uh, the red importance, or do we need to control every component of the ARDs? To do that, we, because we cannot do inoculation, we will know exactly call, call it in a particular site. We have to use a new plant site, then apply selective biocide treatment. So we use the first, we kill lamp code, yes or no, it's the second line here, or we use both of the uh, pesticides can kill lamp code and omycetes, or we have. Um, just kill the lemtoda and fungi, then we kill everything. So this is our predict the AI based on the component we kill, we actually um, predict what happened would be the severity of the ARD. Okay. So the results are quite interesting. Effectively, to control ARD is not particular side we, you, where we had soil from, you have to control everything. Okay. Control umbiotes, fungi, and to give you best root development, best healthy root development. And also, it appears that the competition between umbiotes and fungal pathogen cause ARD. So, the competition is not seems, it's not actually, so um, essentially, the two pathogens compete with each other. And also, we heard a lot about arguing about the fumigation, that is, the fumigation will. Uh, without so much perpetuation to the soil microbiome and long-term effect. But what we show is very interesting. After 15 months of treatment, the soil um, microbiome appears to be pretty same between treated and untreated soil. And uh, although the initial difference after the first six months is really large difference between treated soil and non-treated soil in soil microbiome, um, microbial community, but after 15 months, they are more or less indistinguishable in the treatment. So it doesn't say, that it does indicate so really has capacity, a strong resistance in restore their microbiome. Okay. So, final question is about locating rootstock. So that's the site, you can see the picture on the right hand side, that's the in, uh, 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 give us for experimentation by Heineken where they have a new plant site. And what we did is we plant seven different rootstocks and in the original tree station, but also we plant correspondingly in the center of, of alleyway and of the same um, rootstock. And the uh, sign right sign is right is um, the uh, I think it's a Worcester. Um, so the question we ask is interesting. If replanting is happening, then you expect the the alleyway tree would be better than being the ordinary tree tree station. Second, if you think that the genetic component in 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 rootstock resistance, then the same rootstock and previous plant plant with previous tree station or previous plantation, you have severe uh, replant disease. Then compare other non-genetic related rootstock. Essentially, you can't, we're trying to prove whether lutetian rootstock is a viable option. Okay. So interesting, the results very, 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 very clear. We are really excited about it. Essentially, we prove the rootstock response to ARD is 
definitely genetically controlled. The reason I'm saying that because all three roosters showed um, uh, ARD in that particular site are all genetically related to the previous crop, clearly in that category. We clearly can, we know that. And then the, so essentially, we will say you, know, you can rotate genet, uh, roosters as long as you make sure they are not genetically related or not closely related to new stock, you know their breeding pedigree. Okay? And also, we found out it's really surprising to me is the, the establishment of a clear relationship associated between lysosphere and biota with the plant, with the root. It's very quick, it's virtually about only about half a year. The, the, thereafter, the attached community tends to be reasonable and stable. Okay. So that's essentially what we did. Essentially, we found out is a, uh, from the Happy Project the 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 importance of the the causal agents vary with site. Second, even we don't know the causal agent in particular site, you have to treat for everything, for every component. We need to leave your best without. Finally, and the lutating genotype is partially effective. So that's the three key questions, uh, key results from HAPPY. This actually, and uh, we use that result to get the uh, Horizon 2020 project, which is the, um, the funded site 2019. So this project really look at the soil diversity, uh, understand soil biodiversity to, to enhance biocontrol and biofertilization in horticulture. So, and we use three crops, particularly is tomato, strawberry, and apple. We, uh, for apple, this morning is working on apple, ARD is the system we're going to work with. And we have 16 partners, 11 countries, so it's a five year project, um, finished in 2024. So in the our part of the work, of course, as you say, so we need to work on soil amendment. The trouble that we know with soil amendment with previous work is different types of soil amendment will work against different types of pathogen. The question now we ask, can we actually combine different types of the soil amendment beneficial organism to control the disease complex? So we have the micro which is essentially to um, to improve tree health, they have a plant growth bacteria and to include many primarily to induce plant resistance and also nutrient cycling. They always have a couple of the biochemical organisms, which bacteria, fungi, different type of biochemical organisms. We're trying to have three types of organisms, so you micro the PDPR, biochemical. We actually decided to combine the use, single use, two combined or three all combined. Look at their tree response and in terms of the tree vigor and the leaf plant symptom. And so the trial is planning in, 2000, um, in April 2020. We're going to make an annual assessment and also looking at the root health and the mark bile. We're hope we're assessing fruit and production flowering time in 2003 or 2023, where I have three years old, or it should be plenty number of fruit to work with. Okay, so that's one aspect. This is this is the aspect to answer the question: Can we derive a synthetic amendment combine different property of a beneficial organ to control the breeding complex? Second aspect: Claire, we say the lutate uh, lustra is a, a viable option, but the next question was: Could it be combined with few specific soil amendment? That could that be actually more uh, even have a, a more increased beneficial effect to rely on either just just use soil amendment or just lutating genotype. So this expand we is planted in October 2020. We have three soil amendment. I think it's the mark rather beneficial PGPR biocontrol with five genotype on two sign variety are common. I think two sign is a gala and a raven. Again, we hope to see some um, vigor difference and the, the flowering and the fruiting potential difference in two, in two years' time, two years' time. So that's essentially answer the question about how do we take the loose stock and take us forward combined with solar amendment.
And next thing we want to look at in more detail in a more uh, controlled environment, look at how can we interpret the data obtained from the field uh, if we say the combined treatment leads to better growth. So we're trying to look in more controlled environment condition study, look at the combined use or single use PDPR and bar control microliter on root development, root health, compared with source so sterilization. We hope to finish this one to complete uh, to start this work in, two, in April this year, uh, finishing next end of next year. Okay, so we we'll hope by this three experiment we can actually uh, understand the field effect, the, the 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 integration of different management against ARD, and trying to obtain the lab data or control condition data to explain biologically why it worked. Okay, so finally, this is part actually link naturally nicely to Chris Cook's talk, the next one. We're also trying to understand uh, this, whether the amendment uh, soil with certain beneficial organism could uh, help the resilience of the soil mark bar um, in terms of climate change scenarios. Uh, particularly, uh, when you talk about the CO2 temperature, Chris will talk about, we also interested in drought and water logging. A lot of you here will know autumn water logging is one of the predisposing conditions for cancer development. So we will see whether actually by amending soil with certain um, beneficials will reduce the ARD demand, but also could help and treat tolerant to drought or water in autumn, which in turn will reduce the cancer development. So this was done jointly with uh, with CTPs and Chris. Chris will talk about. I hope this next talk we may touch about it in this subject. So of course I'm not doing much work anymore. I love stuff in the in the in the project. I do not understand at all. So I rely on my very capable and hardworking colleague to deliver the work. So all the people is in the on this slide are grateful. For their hard work and delivering all the project and uh, um, those outcomes could potentially have great in, uh, industry impact. So I'll stop here, Scott. Thank you, Shang Ming. I, um, I'm going to move straight on, if I may. We've just slightly run over, but because Chris Cook's talk is going to go straight into following on what Shang Ming's talking about, um, Rob, I'll come back to you at the end of that. Um, thank you so much, Shang Ming. Some really exciting information coming out of that, uh, uh, which you know, could potentially have huge impact on the industry within a few years. Um, so thank you so much, Shang Ming. Um, stand by in case we've got any further questions for you after Chris's presentation, but we're going to bring Chris Cook in now. Um, like Sophia, who talked to us earlier on, um, Chris is another CTP student. Um, Chris is in his third year, so he's a year behind Sophia's stage of his PhD, and he's doing that at NIA BMR in conjunction with Cranfield University. Chris, just carry on the theme that uh, Shang Ming's been talking to us about, please. Thank you very much, Scott. I uh, appreciate the introduction. So yeah, this is quite a nice follow on from what Zhang Ming just spoke to you all about. Uh, so my project is now into its third year and it's about understanding the resilience of soil beneficials to combat apple replant disease. So I don't need to go into too much context really because Zhang Ming has quite nicely told you about apple replant disease. But what I just want to touch on is the fact that the standard treatment of chemical fumigation now is obviously being banned by government legislation. And those that we have are both expensive and ineffective. So looking for biological soil amendments to replace these due to them being renewable, cheaper and environmentally safe is so important. And some of those options we have are the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, the biocontrol agents and the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, but these are obviously yet to be widely used and uh, there's limited products on the market right now for what we can use. So the aims and objectives of my project is to identify these beneficial microorganisms and to use them in pre-planting uh, in an orchard and hence to either reduce or eliminate ARD or to improve fruit productivity. So the way it's split is into sort of long-term and short-term objectives. So the long-term objective is to pre-plant an orchard with biological soil amendments and then track the growth rate over time and the uh, yield and, uh, and to how well the plant is growing. 
and uh, the, the genetic side of it as well that Zhangming touched on quite elegantly is uh, is also important. So whether we can have a similar scion with a different rootstock, and whether that will affect how severe ARD is. Uh, for short-term work, I'm looking at rhizosphere populations, so seeing whether uh, any pre-plant amendment we apply will change the rhizosphere population of a tree, and whether the functionality of that soil will change over time as well. So will there be uh, any improvements in the function of a soil if we apply a specific biological control agent? And also the climate change stress, like Jack Changling mentioned, so increased CO2 uh, concentration, increased temperatures and drought and water logging and whether those will affect the functionality or the populations. Um, today, for time's sake, I'm just going to touch on the climate change side of the work and how that affects the populations of soil. So I conducted an experiment in 2019 with the hypothesis of whether our temperature and CO2 concentration differences will alter the population of apple bulk soil that have recently been grubbed. So the closest we could get to apple replant disease soil and then to track after five weeks of exposure of these two conditions to see whether there was changes in the microbiome populations. So we had two sites in this trial. We had an organic managed site and a conventionally managed site. So one had chemical applications and one did not. We had two temperatures and we went for the upper range of the temperatures. So a 25 degree ambient and then a 29 degrees treatment, which would be a, obviously an extremely hot uh, weather event. Uh, and then we had three CO2 concentrations. We went for a 400 parts per million ambient which was just in a growth chamber, so naturally uh, CO2 concentration in the air, and then a 5,000 and a 10,000 parts per million treatment to see the upper end of extreme CO2 concentrations that we might see. And of course, in the soils as well, CO2 concentration is going to be slightly higher than in the air anyway. So we did aluminum MySeq on, on, uh, on the soils. We extracted DNA and then sequenced them. Uh, and we can see that for most of the samples in this trial, we had good coverage. So a plateau of a line for each sample means we're covering all the species in that sample. And we have one sample down here, sample 30, that didn't, uh, didn't sequence very well, so that was removed. But overall, the samples did well. Um, so firstly, I wanted to look at the alpha diversity of the samples. So alpha diversity is a measure of local diversity. Um, so it was just the, a raw number of a more diverse sample has a higher alpha and obviously a less diverse has a lower. And what we can see is in the 400 um, control sample, we have the highest median here uh, and it was slightly reduced in the 5,000 and 10,000 samples. Um, but we had a higher interquartile range for these two. So we had a much more varying alpha diversity in those samples, whereas it was a bit more narrow in the uh, ambient treatments. And it was a similar situation for temperature increase. So we saw no temperature increase, uh, zero here, it was slightly higher. And again, at the plus four degrees here, 29, it was slightly lower, but we have the higher range again in the data. So that was for bacteria. So for fungi, um, it was a similar story. Uh, again, we saw a slight reduction, more so in the 10,000 and the 5,000. And again, the reduction at the plus four degrees. When we looked at beta diversity, uh, this was plotted using a multi-dimensional scaling plot. So what this plot shows is uh, an increased distance between points means more dissimilarity between the diversities. So we're looking for clustering of points to see whether they have a different microbiome here. What we can see is there's a massive difference between left and right here, and that is due to sight, and I will show you that in, in a minute. Um, but we can see on the right-hand side, which I believe is uh, organic, uh, there is a slight clustering between each of the treatments. Uh, but there's no significant clustering overall in this one. Um, and again, for temperature, similar story. There's a slight difference in, I believe, the organic plot, but overall quite a big clustering. And then when we look at fungi, it's quite a similar story. Um, much more mixing here. Uh, the populations are, are much more similar on this plot. Uh, there's no significant differences. Uh, and for temperature as well, we could potentially see the plus four degrees are clustering slightly away from the zeros. Uh, they might be higher up on the plot, but again, quite mixed. So we're not seeing any massive differences at a population scale here for um, beta diversity. So as I mentioned, uh, what we saw the most difference for was, was site management. So what we know is that if you're manage your, managing your plot conventionally, uh, you're going to have a much different population to if you're managing your plot um, organically. So this is worth paying attention to because if there's significantly a uh, difference in beneficials or pathogens between these two, uh, you'll want to amend your management strategy uh, accordingly. 
because uh, you might have uh, things you're missing if you manage organically, for example. And again, for fungi, it's the same. Uh, I think these two were outliers due to low sequence quality here for the fungi, but we have, again, this big clustering between uh, organic and conventional. So uh, there's definitely a difference here between populations due to management for both bacteria and fungi on this plot. So I've shown you a sort of a population level, but it's also interesting to know at an individual species level. So what we use in sequencing is a, an OTU or an operational taxonomic unit, which is a predicted species essentially. And we use the package DESIC2 to visualize these differential OTUs. So on this plot on the right hand side, this is a volcano plot. Um, any plot colored in red is both significant and has a log two fold change between uh, the mean or you know between the two samples here of the two treatments uh, of more than one so it's like a significantly different OTU and we only have four here or what we can see on this plot however if we wanted to plot that for the site difference for bacteria you can see there's a lot more difference here uh, so that kind of shows uh, why we were seeing that difference at a population level compared to what we're seeing sort of uh, at an individual level but there are still differences here so it's worth noting what these differences are and whether they're uh, biologically important in soils. So when we look at the bacteria um, and we look at the, the top six most different OTUs, so with the most difference, um, what we can see is two of these I want you to pay attention to uh, is a genus of flavor bacterium and a genus of uh, sardicinus. Um, and one is a plant growth promoter and one is a potential biocontrol. It's a pathogen of, uh, it's a predator pathogen here. So it will, um, it will attack pathogens in the soil. Um, also, it's worth noting the confidence scores as well. Uh, the database, obviously, we, we have to get a, a perfect match for it to be 100% with the sequences that we found compared to the databases. But well, that's 100% with the flavor bacterium, but for this one, it's only 36%. So we have to take these with a pinch of salt. But these were significantly reduced in the, uh, in the treated samples when we treated with CO2. So we might see a lot of these. Uh, in future when climate change stresses become abundant in our orchards. But it's worth noting because these are now candidates for amendment or, you know, to targeting to be put back into soils in future or even now. It's also worth looking at individual OTUs that we are interested in. So, for example, AMF here. So we have two species of uh, glomus on the left and the centre, and we have a rhizophagus irregularis on the right. And what we can see is this negative trend on the two on the right hand side. Um, we're seeing a reduction from the controls and then loss in the middle between the, the CO2 treatments and a reduction for the middle CO2 treatment and then complete loss for the other one. So when we actually look at OTUs of interest, we're also seeing that they're being reduced in these conditions. So although on a overall population there was no differences, these beneficials are actually being lost from what, when we did see them. So it's worth going into a bit more detail here. But sort of a summary of what I've shown you is, uh, like I said, the alpha and beta diversity were not significantly impacted on a population level. But that only tells half the story, really, because as we delve into more individual OTUs, we're seeing that some we're massively interested in are actually changing. What we also see is that site had the most differences. Uh, so whether you're managing your plot conventionally or organically, the approach you take to overcome these differences is going to be different for each and therefore your sort of management uh, packages are going to be different uh, and the work will have to be different for each. So the similar work is going to be conducted the same sort of workflow for uh, soils amended with um, single species amendments so um, specific beneficials of PGPR, AMF uh, and we can compare the differences on both population and individual level for, for those two and an additional climate stress of waterlogging and drought, like Jamie mentioned, with the waterlogging being massively influential with canker. So we have to pay attention to all the different stresses we might see during climate change. Uh, well, we also want to see, we also see that the differential OTUs here uh, do have a beneficial effect and that they're being lost. So we don't know how significant that effect is. And we're also, we don't know how, uh, because we're only at genus level for a lot of the stuff, we don't know what those individual species are yet, but we may be lacking these microbes in future. So it's worth noting what they are and whether we can create products containing these microbes to amend the soils. And also as databases improve, these technique becomes 
these techniques become a lot more powerful. So this work goes hand in hand with people who are sequencing uh, bacteria and fungi in soil. And as their work on goes, our work becomes even more powerful and better. It's hopefully to the point where we have everything in the soil, mostly sequenced that we're interested in, and you can see these 100% uh, confidence and then come up with products or make products uh, based on these. But obviously, it's difficult to isolate a lot of things from soil. So we'll see how that research comes on in the future. That's sort of the end of what I want to tell you about. So just acknowledgements to my three supervisors and the technical teams at both NIBMR and uh, Granfield University. And I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any before the break. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Um, well, let's bring Shang Ming and, and uh... Uh, Rob back in if, if I may um, just just very briefly because we are at the break stage but um, first of all to Rob Rob how, how many growers out there would you say are, are employing um, soil additives or soil amendments before or whilst planting new orchards well I think I think the great majority um, it's it's slightly unclear what it is I think that, that's being achieved but I think Growers feel that um, the cost of adding uh, AMF is relatively low and the investment is already so considerable that they feel they want to do everything that's within their power to get the trees away well. Uh, so I think it's a, I think it's very widely used. OK, and I suppose this question would go to Chris and, and or Shang Ming, if Shang Ming's still with us. Uh, you know, how much scope is there at the moment in the industry to, to test your soils? Because you've just been telling us how different soils are, are, are uh, behave in different ways, depending on the type of soil, climate and so on. Um, what scope is there for growers to actually assess their soils as, it, as, as they are to find out whether or not these additives are going to help? So yeah, I'll start with that one. I mean, uh, these big differences between organic and conventional are obviously you know, quite obvious here. So every soil is going to be different and the type of soil as well is going to react differently too. So if you have a more clay-based soil, uh, it's going to react differently with water, for example. So you may have a different effect of a, of a drought or a water logging in your soils. Um, but a lot of these um, obviously beneficials we've seen are ubiquitous between all the different soils. So I feel like the beneficial effect, if you can make it associate with your uh, with your tree, which is obviously the initial problem, there's definitely going to be scope there. Uh, the limitations is a lot of these, especially AMF and uh, any other sort of amendment you need to do before you plant the tree, you, you're on a limited time scale. You only have that option at the time of planting. But but if you uh, want to apply something like a, like a PGPR, you can do that through drenching of the soil around the tree. So... Uh, you can test your soil, see what you have, and apply that during the tree's lifetime rather than being limited by time. So there's definitely more scope for something that you can apply during the tree's life uh, than something that you're limited to at time of planting, I think. Okay, thank you, Chris. And finally, Chiang Ming, because we need to break, uh, just a question to you. Um, the the, the EU-funded work that you're doing, um, what, when or how will we be able to view the results of, of that project? Will there be a, a, a report on the NIAB EMR website? Is it something that we can promote at AHDB? Uh, how, how do you see that working out? You're, you're welcome, more than welcome to promote uh, any work for EU. That's the, one of the conditions in the contract. So I welcome any opportunity to talk to you in the future uh, where when I have, we have a hopefully some really interesting result or positive result to report. No problem okay. whatsoever, yeah? Okay. Scott, can I dive in with a really, really quick question for Zhang Ming? Zhang Ming please, please, please but yes, and this needs to be the last and then we'll break. Okay, okay. it's really quick. Zhang Ming, if you're attempting to uh, manage replant with simply um, resting the ground in a long rotation, can I invite you to speculate about the kind of what length of time will it take for uh, the ground to return to, if you like, fresh ground status? Um, if I actually, on the memory serve me right, I know the couple of experiments done in other countries, they actually grew a cover crop, different crop between the uh, grabbing the old orchard and the planting new orchard. I think it's, they say it's two years, you actually change the new crop, change the so bottom up by so completely you can plant tree without any issue of replant. I remember that's been published a couple of years ago. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
Good. Yeah. At that point, let's break. Um, I'm conscious uh, people will be tired. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Shang Ming. Thank you, Rob, for putting things into context. We're going to have a break now. Um, we had planned 15 minutes, but I think let's stick to time. So if you can reconvene at quarter past, you've got 10 minutes to go and uh, grab a cup of tea or a biscuit, or whatever you want to do. Um, and we'll join us again in, uh, in 10 minutes time at quarter past three. And thank you again for uh, uh, all the splendid talks we've had in this first session. OK, welcome back to the afternoon session or the second session of this afternoon, I should say. I hope you're all well rested. Um, in the first session, we heard a lot about tree health, disease control. Um, this after, the, the second session is going to focus more on insect pests uh, and a lot of the work that we have been funding both at NIRBMR and elsewhere in controlling um, uh, in, insect pests for the industry. Now, um, You'll just see, if you look at the uh, session two, we're going to start off with Celine Silva talking about uh, pollination at the Plum Demonstration Centre. Um, we've got a little bit on Willie Appleaford from another CTP student, Sindhanaya Godfrey. We'll look at enhancing beneficial insects again from Celine. And then we've got three talks on SWD, which will then take us towards the end of our afternoon. And we'll finish off with Carlotta uh, Gonzalez Noguer talking about winter dormancy. And finally, with Richard Colgan giving us an update on our storage work that we've been doing. So all that to come. But uh, first, I'm going to introduce Celine Silva. Celine works at NIA BMR and the entomology team with Mar. Uh, <coughs> with Michelle Fountain and her team. She's worked there for some time. Um, we, we heard all about uh, the Plum Demonstration Centre earlier on in the afternoon. Um, specifically, Celine is going to talk to us a little bit about some work that she and her colleagues have been doing surveying pollination uh, at the Plum Demonstration Centre. I should say about the centre that it's uh, dedicated there not only to show best practice in plum production, but also to give us more information or allow us the opportunity to demonstrate best practice in other areas and find out more information about such things as pollination. So Celine, take us through what you've been doing in the last year. Okay, thank you, Scott. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the work that the entomology team has been doing at the Plum Demonstration uh, Center. And our main objectives for this work were to um, assess the floral mix establishment in alleyways. So we have done that previously in apple orchards, but uh, we wanted to see uh, what what improvements we can do with that in the plum orchard. We also looked at pollinators, so what pollinators, main pollinators are uh, visiting plum. We also looked at pollination and uh, if it needed to be improved, so if, if there is margin to improve pollination in plum. Uh, and we also looked at beneficials uh, in the plum trees. So I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about how we do it so we can understand a little bit better the results. So first, like I said, we looked at the floral uh, mix uh, establishment. So we did that in July and uh, we looked to see if, if the sowing would have been successful. So we also looked at pollinator surveys. Uh, there isn't much information about plum and we did that by walking transects of 30 minutes very slowly in two of the rows. Um, so we walk to avoid counting uh, the same insects uh, twice. And we did that uh, twice during flowering stage. We also looked at pollination deficit. So for that, uh, we selected two plots, each of 10 trees. And what we did was we selected two branches in each tree. And, and we, we selected one branch for hand pollination and a second branch for open pollination. Oh, sorry. Uh, we also set up two different plots, one with wig nests. So what we did, we selected three rows and eight trees. So that gives us about 24 trees in which we deployed a wig nest in each tree. We then selected the same area 
and didn't deploy any weakness. So we looked at tap sampling, aphids, and we monitored the refuges in those in both areas. We also looked when doing the assessment at the six middle trees. So moving on to the floral mix establishment. So one of the areas was an open crop, so uncovered. Uh, and in this area, we didn't have much success with our floral mix. So what happened is that the non-competitive process that we add to our seed mix uh, established well, but we had no luck with our wildflower species. Uh, this highlights a lot the importance of uh, cuttings in the first year. So we didn't cut enough that, uh, that area. And, and by not doing that, we didn't uh, we successfully establish our uh, sowing mix. So another area was the covered area. So under the tunnels, this one did a little bit better. We had about 20% uh, of establishment. We had oxide daisy, sunpoin, and yarrow that belonged to our mix. So a little bit uh, better. It's not a lot, 20, around 20% of establishment, but uh, as I'm going to talk uh, later uh, in the enhancing ecology uh, study, you will see that uh, sometimes there is, there is a small establishment at the beginning, but that can be improved through uh, a proper management of your, uh, of your floral area. Another area of the of the orchard was the one that was planted this year. So we looked at it before uh, before the trees were planted, and we didn't sow anything in that area. So just looking at what was there, what was left to grow there, and there was quite a few percent, uh, a big percentage of bare soil. Uh, plantain species were there, a white clover. So uh, not, not a very diverse uh, area. So what we did with this area, and Marzena mentioned that we sowed a seed mix in September this uh, last year. Uh, and what we did was we got our mixes from Emmer's Gate Seeds. If you want to uh, browse to their website, they have details about, about each seed mix, and we used 50% of EM5 and 50% of EM7. And we hope to uh, monitor that for, for this year. So also about uh, pollinator survey. So we found, we did the pollinator survey in March. So uh, the first flowering. And we noticed that the main visitors were bumblebees, honeybees, overflies, and solitary bees. So they're, they're, uh, this is an early flowering crop and they are uh, the main visitors in early flowering crops. I must mention that uh, the previous uh, pollinator survey and this uh, pollination deficit uh, study are under the indirect bespoke trial uh, that we, we do in several orchards. And here we looked at fruit quality and to see if there was room for, for improvement in pollination. And we did this on a Victoria variety. It's a self-fertile variety. And we didn't, we didn't record any differences between the hand-pollinated fruits and the open-pollinated fruits. So this may be uh, because it's self or it may be that the pollination is just uh, it's at a good uh, standard. Uh, this area uh, has also, uh, this study has been done in an area where the seed mix is also applied and had the 20% uh, percent, uh, establishment. So it could also be boosting the, the pollinator numbers. So we also looked at what was present in the canopy of the trees. Uh, we looked at the plots that had the weakness versus the plots that didn't have the weaknesses. So here, this is, we did uh, first two 
two assessments, one in May, one in June. And for the first assessment, the weakness were in the field about three months, so it's not a long time uh, to see an effect. So we're treating this year as a baseline year. So we're trying not to read too much into those uh, numbers. Aphid numbers were not that high, so it's about two, uh, two aphids per six trees. So uh, not a, a huge number, but I should say that the, the orchard was sprayed for aphids, also one in, once in May and once in June, as soon as we saw some uh, damage on the trees. We had some significant results, but again, not to read too much, in, too much into, into it this year. There was uh, ladybirds, endochloroids, parasitoids, but numbers were quite low and uh, those couldn't be analyzed statistically. We also did a nighttime assessment for real wigs, so they are more active at night, so it's easier to get um, uh, a number, uh, more accurate number of their population. So we found that there was a little bit more in control than in the wig nest plus, but again, not significantly different, and, and, but, but good numbers, I mean, uh, almost four uh, per tree. And I should mention that this orchard is also under an earwig friendly spray program that was recommended by Michelle Fountain, and, and that together with the wig nest might be helping boosting with numbers. So at the end of the season, we looked at um, what was using the wig nests. So we opened them and and we found very good numbers of wig nests of earwigs in the in them, um, more than five in average per wig nest, and this means five per tree. So it's it's a good number. Uh, there are publications that uh, indicate that five. Uh, Ewigs per tree are able to uh, control cuddling moth. And um, we also found spiders. We, we've been finding spiders in other or in apple orchards, in wing nests. We know they, they usually use them and their numbers uh, increase year to year. Uh, there's there were some of those species of spiders were uh, nesting in them. And we also found a ladybirds that is also another. Uh, natural enemy, so good to have around. Mm -hmm. So, in conclusion, um, from the two areas that we saw in 2019, we uh, only one uh, established uh, sufficiently. Uh, and, like I said, this highlights the the importance of managing your wildflower uh, area. Uh, most frequent uh, pollinators were honeybees, bumblebees, solitary bees, and overflies. Uh, and we we saw no pollination deficit on Victoria. And we're hoping to uh, choose another variety for this year and and uh, see if the same is true for other varieties. Um, we are treating this year as a baseline, so not too much to read into uh, differences. And again, we had good numbers of earwigs. Like I said, around five earwigs per refuge uh, is, is quite a good number. Uh, for the upcoming year, we hope to continue with pollinator surveys and plum quality under the Indirect Bespoke project. Uh, we will also continue to monitor uh, beneficials and pests in trees and, and also looking at uh, numbers of earwigs and looking at what's using the wig nests, the predator refuges that we deployed uh, last year. So uh, thank you for listening and if you have any question I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much Celine. Um, a quick question from me, question. you showed in the graph um, where there was a control against the wig nests that there were more earwigs in the control. Uh, was was that compared just to the wig nest itself or was that looking at the plots, wig nets and other areas as well? Yeah, those were, those were looking at the trees. So we tap sampled the trees and we did that in the middle of the control plot in the middle of the, the where the intervention was made. So, so that's not inside the wig nest. 
Okay. That's just okay. To the ones the ones that were on the cap canopy of the tree. Yeah. Okay. And and would you expect to see the numbers in wig nests increasing over time? Um, that's been the suggestion before, but are, are you going to wait and see? Uh, yeah, we're going to wait and see. <laughs> but yeah, there there are good numbers. I mean, we've been monitoring apple orchards, and and uh, some of them uh, don't have this number, uh, and they they have much more established ecosystems. Uh, so so this is this is already a very good start. Good. Okay. We've got another specific question here for you, um, Celine. Um, bearing, in mind, bearing in mind that wig nests increase predator numbers, do you think that it is worth introducing them in plum orchards, it's presumably in commercial, more commercial orchards than the than the orchard at EMR? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think so. If you if if they are, it's important to for you to monitor too, knowing your numbers. And and if you don't have enough, then you could introduce some, and the wig nests will allow them to have a shelter. Okay, Rob, I'm bringing you in at this point. How many wig nests do you see in your daily life walking around commercial orchards? Um, not many yet. I think uh, I think they're coming. I think this is it's it's kind of early days for this project, isn't it? Uh, I think the results will get more interesting over time as the orchard. Uh, ecology becomes more established. Um, this is this is very much a sort of preliminary results, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and and we've just had an additional comment from Michelle Fountain, uh, who works with Celine, saying that it would be good to look at predatory mite releases for control of rust mites, for example, uh, in future. So um, there's a lot more scope to to add to what we're already doing. Another question here for Celine: Have you assessed the possible fruit damage by earwigs? No, no, we didn't. We didn't do that. Um, oh, and any views on that? There, Sorry, so go on, Celine. Yeah, I, I have I have seen some uh, literature that that mentions some uh, damage, but I don't think they have they 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 get to us a conclusion about if earwigs really have an economical damage, but we haven't looked at it personally so we can't we can't in, conclude anything okay okay i think uh, it's another... still unclear isn't it i think uh, i think that very often you see earwigs around damaged fruit but whether whether they were the primary cause of damage uh, i think is is very very much open to question isn't it we have a comment, um, somebody suggesting that uh, earwigs do become more of pests in cherry orchards. Um, lots, of, lots of comments coming back in on this. Um, Michelle, again, is saying this, we need to do more research in this area. Uh, we don't have enough uh, to, to uh, confirm that, um, and particularly in plums, which obviously don't receive a lot of research funding. Um, uh, somebody else saying earwigs are not actually the cause of damage. So there's a whole range of views here and perhaps more work to be done uh, on this, Rob. Let's, um, we're going to come back to this area slightly in, 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 in the talk after next. Um, we're working Celine extremely hard today, so she's going to talk to us again. So let's, let's move on to the next slot, if we may. Um, and we've now got uh, Sindanaya Godfrey. Um, Sindanaya is another CTP student. I talked about the C CTP students earlier. Um, we've had two fantastic talks from them. Um, I'm sure Sindanaya is going to keep everybody interested because she's talking about the dreaded woolly apple aphid. Um, Sindanaya has been doing some research uh, looking at resistance and susceptibility in interactions between the apple itself and the woolly aphid. So Sindanaya, tell us how you've been getting on. Yeah, um, thank you. So um, I'm a second year PhD student, um, registered at Harper Adams University in Shropshire, but I'm based at NIA BMR and I'm, uh, yeah, part of the CTP. Um, so three key aims for this project are to increase understanding of the pest, uh, but also to look at resistance genes that are known, to look at the ones that we know about already and improve mapping of them, um, but also to identify some potential novel resistance genes. So I'm just going to because it's quite an early stage of the project, we're only about 18 months in, I'm going to talk through some key parts of the project, some results that we do already have, and then a little bit about future work. So a bit of background about the, the aphid, just in case you've managed to miss it somehow. So um, it's uh, thought to be from North America in origin. 
first observed in Britain uh, 240 years ago. Uh, it's all over the world now. It's got this really distinctive white wax, which is protective for it, but it makes the uh, colonies pretty noticeable in the orchard. Um, and there are four woolly apple aphid resistance genes that we already know about and are defined, but there's quite a lot more potential um, genes, which are, you know, pretty, we know that they are, we know that they're there, but um, we just need to find a bit about them. So the reason that uh, we're working on woolly apple aphid and why it's a problem is that um, we know that infestations tend to increase after warm winters because uh, they can just get out, out and about a bit more quickly, uh, which obviously it's going to be a problem with predicted global warming. Um, it's a problem all around the world, as I said, but especially in the southern hemisphere where conditions seem to be really perfect for it. Um, and there are some reports in some of these countries of um, aphids that are able to overcome these resistance genes that we think we've already got. So that's obviously an issue of concern. A bit about the actual damage that it causes. So when aphids are feeding, they inject saliva into plant cells and they use that to sense like what they're feeding on. Um, but in woolly apple aphid saliva, uh, this causes cells in the phloem to rapidly proliferate, which creates these galls in this picture on the right. Uh, which can then block sap flow around the plant, which can seriously stunt growth. Uh, but also these uh, galls become vulnerable to secondary fungal infections, especially under extreme weather conditions and temperatures. So if they're having uh, thawing and freezing, they'll split open and then um, canker and other fungal infections can get in. Uh, Woolly aphids tend to like to live on um, the path of least resistance. So they'll often feed on existing wounds. So uh, pruning injuries is a really good example. So they're feeding on wounds. They're bringing uh, problems of their own and they're making the plant more vulnerable to fungi. So it becomes quite a serious risk to plant health. There's also some links between uh, woolly apple aphid feeding under tree collars and fire blight. So it's a big, there's quite a lot of uh, problems that aren't directly caused by woolly apple aphid, but which are part and parcel of it. Um, a bit about the actual aphid biology. So uh, a normal aphid life cycle that you'd expect to see is alternating between two hosts. So in the case of woolly apple aphid, this is between on apple in the summer and then moving over onto elm in the autumn. The asexual stage where they're just repeating and proliferating over and over and over again is on apple and then the sexual forms will move on to elm. Outside of America for some reason they've lost this wider circle and so they're just doing this small one over and over again on apple which is what's really allowed it to become a pest because there's no rest for the apple. It's not six months a year it's 12 months of just woolly aphid on it which is um, uh, a bit mysterious and, uh, and it travels around from the roots up to the scion in the summer to feed on fresh tissue. So these winged forms produce uh, sexual males and females which mate in America but uh, they don't seem to do that anywhere else and I'll, I'll touch later on why that's important that we're missing that, we seem to be missing that sexual stage. Part of the project is looking at um, is it that they've completely lost this stage or is it just that they're not using it uh, for example, there's not a lot of American elm in the rest of the world, as you might think, although it is there, but it's not as uh, present. So one um, thing that I've been looking at is um, whether or not there are, or one thing I will be looking at is whether or not we can induce them using um, autumnal conditions, so low temperature and short days. But part of the, uh, the small life cycle on apple, as I mentioned, is that they're on the roots during the winter and on the scion during the summer. So uh, one thing which I'm kind of halfway through just because of the time of year is that the start of winter, surveying a number of um, potted trees to see if they had aphids on them and then surveying them again. So in the next few weeks, I'll look at them kind of after the winter to see whether or not they're still there. What stage of life they're at and also I don't know how well you can see but if you can see these little kind of yellow swellings their galls on the roots and seeing if you know they've increased so that will be quite interesting to um to look at in the next few weeks to get those data um so looking at the life cycle like this is great for um small populations you know I can I can do it with the aphids that we've got e-smalling but as I mentioned it's definitely more of a global issue so one thing that we can do to measure that is looking at differences in uh, genetic variability between populations. 
if you've got uh, an aphid that's reproducing with that small circle there, they're reproducing clonally, which means that any offspring are direct clones of their mother. So you, you wouldn't see a lot of genetic diversity there. But if they're sexually reproducing, you'd expect to see a lot more genetic diversity because you've got constant mixing of genetics between the sexually reproducing individuals. Why is this a problem? So as I mentioned very briefly at the start, there are some aphids which have been observed to feed on resistant rootstocks. If it's a clonally reproducing population in all of the world except America, that's not as much of a concern, although it is a concern, because it will take a lot longer for individuals all separately to develop that ability to feed on those rootstocks. But if they're unbeknownst to us secretly sexually reproducing, then that could spread really quickly through a population and there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to scrap that rootstock. So what uh, I have been doing is collecting samples of aphids from uh, around the country, a couple of other samples from other places in the world are coming in and then analysing them using, uh, so it's a discriminant analysis of, I forgot the metaphor, I'm sorry. Anyway, what it does, basically what it does, it's easier to explain what it does than just give you a name, is it measures um, in-group and out-group genetic variation. So it looks at samples that you've got and says, well, these are different within a group, but these are not more different within the group than they are to ones outside. So there's a couple of samples here, all from southeast England. Um, so you can see at the bottom, they're kind of mostly clustered together. And if they're close together, it means that they're not that genetically different. So there's two populations, uh, one from the National Fruit Collection and one from just on site at East Malling that are looking a little bit different. But in the top right, in that yellow box, is a um, uh, population that's collected in Surrey, which is not that far away from Kent, but um, it's it's showing as being quite different from these other samples, uh, which is a really good start to show that we are obviously seeing some difference between populations. We're not seeing any difference within them. If we were, you'd see like a, a spider web kind of pattern of lots of different points connected together, but we're not seeing that. This is very uh, early, early stage data. So what would come next and what is it's just chugging along is samples from places like North America to look at how that's differing and from some of those southern hemisphere countries where we think that they might be behaving quite differently from here but also to just repeat lots and lots of samples from within the UK because then you can uh, get multiple samples from populations and get that kind of spider webbing potentially that I mentioned if we are seeing variation within the population if we not it won't be there so that's a lot of uh, bad news I guess about the aphid but now what can you do about it? So there are um, oh, lots of options, well a few options for woolly apple aphid control especially on the scion. So there's some natural enemies available so um, earwigs which we've been quite a hot topic today, um, parasitoid wasp and then some other more generalist predators. There are a couple of um, traditional pesticides um, but they can't really work on the roots. I mean, Aspira tetramac can, because it, it can travel down to the roots and affect aphids that are feeding there, but you've still got to know that they're there. Uh, you can't just, you know, you're not going to spray on the off chance that you've got them. So resistant rootstocks become a really good option for um, reliably controlling aphids feeding below the ground, because you know that it's going to be resistant without actually having to, uh, to check it. And it can play uh, a part of an IPM program and combine it with some of these other control mechanisms. So how this project is going to contribute to uh, the wider kind of NIBMR rootstock breeding program. Uh, as I mentioned, there are four um, Leafle for resistance genes, but I'm just going to talk about the first one at the moment, which was identified from Northern Spy in the 60s, but it's been known that Northern Spy is resistant for quite a long time. This pair, two images on the right, the black and white ones, are from a 1924 paper from East Smalling, which found that Northern Spy has thickened um, sclerenchyma, which is tissue around the phloem. And all it does is it just mechanically blocks the aphid mouth parts from getting to the phloem. Uh, it's not known how the other three resistance genes uh, confer resistance, but it's probably something similar to this. And uh, this is important to understand because there are a couple of commercial rootstocks which have been developed using this resistance gene. So it's good to know how they're working. What we want to do with this. So this last year I've been working on um, mapping this resistance gene using a couple of 
uh, populations which can thought to contain this gene and segregate for it. So this is all working towards the kind of um, master goal of master assist, marker assisted selection, which um, it's I guess it's kind of like key headline is that it's um, really will speed up breeding process. So normally it can take 20 to 25 years for a traditional trait to be bred for from kind of um, first idea to commercial introduction because it takes so many different stages of um, crossing and phenotyping and uh, going through and through. Whereas if you've got genetic markers which are really closely linked to a gene that you're looking for, you just look for those markers and it speeds up the process massively. So there have been some markers associated for all of these genes um, and quite a few for this first one, but um, one important goal of this project is to develop more and better markers, uh, which will really help us move towards marker-assisted selection for woolly aflatoxin resistance. So part of the uh, project was looking at the potential for finding new genes. Why do you need new genes if we've got four already? Well, those um, aphids that I mentioned have been able to overcome um, at least three of these four resistant genes. That doesn't mean that they're completely written off forever. Obviously, we've got other control mechanisms and it's not, these, uh, these aphids aren't observed in all the world. But it's always important to have kind of backups because if something goes wrong and you lose your one resistance gene, you're in real trouble. But also having multiple means that you can uh, do something called gene pyramiding where you can combine multiple resistance genes together which uh, just uh, is expected to give a more durable rootstock so you don't have to keep generating new resistant rootstocks every few year, well, few years, 50 years say. Um, but also there's a there's a control, uh, there's concern that you might you might think without sexual reproduction that, that there won't be an issue but obviously there's always the potential to just manually transmit for these resistance breaking aphids into the UK so if that happens um, it'd be good to have a backup ready. Um, so what we did for this was looking at different species of crab apples, which um, we think would have appropriate flowering times. That was kind of the uh, the starting idea, was that in in an orchard they might be functioning as reservoirs for woolly apple aphid if these uh, crab apples are being used as pollen sources. So. Um, I know that's not always a, a recommended practice anymore, but I think in some, some parts of the world it still really is. So that was the start of it, but also this will allow us to look at potential novel resistance genes that we didn't think about beforehand. So these are the results of that from over the summer. Um, I'll just put out some key bits of the graph because it's quite busy. So over on the left are the very susceptible um, accessions and species that we saw, M9 there, I think we all probably would have seen that one coming. Um, and then it's quite good to see, so over on the northern spire, it's kind of fallen in the middle, but um, Malus robusta 5, which carries the second woolly apple aphid resistance gene, is coming up as being completely resistant, so that's really good. And there's a couple of candidates in here that are suspected to be resistant, so Malus floribunda, um, but that just haven't had um, that, that level of mapping done it yet, so it's not really known like where they are in the genome. But there's a couple of other ones in here which um, which could be really great candidates for um, investigating further and seeing if they'd be suitable for introduction into a resistance breeding program. So that's brilliant for the breeding, but um, also in terms of aphid feeding, it's just really interesting to see this um, this range of susceptibility. You know, it's not all black and white. They can't feed, or they're absolutely covering it. It's um, it's even some of these in, uh, northern spy there, but then a different Malus robusta is also coming out kind of in the middle. So um, one thing that we're going to be doing going forward is imaging some of these to look at whether they've got that thickening of the sclerenchyma that I mentioned, but also um, doing a couple of techniques for um, aphid, investigating aphid growth and population growth, um, which should be starting soon. And a couple of different rootstocks just to see how they, uh, the populations are able to grow. Do they just uh, they don't ever feed and don't get established at all or it's kind of like a slow dwindle because they're not able to get as much sap as they need um but that's planned for the next few years um why is this important really uh, especially on the different ones and why are these two measures of aphid um growth important so these pictures at the bottom are two sides of the same glass house compartment you can see that the uh um, there's been quite different responses of the trees in this uh, in this study. So it'd be good to look at uh, how they're operating under control conditions so we can kind of understand that a bit better. Um, 
luckily for the rest of the project they're going to be in a polytunnel so I probably won't see this much variation which is a relief um, but it it does kind of start to bring in question some of that susceptibility when there's obviously could be such a strong variation in plant health and in aphid health depending on the conditions um, so that's that's a justification for that bit really and um, and that's all I've got it's just a, as I say quite a brief introduction because it's an early stage so to thank my supervisors at uh, Harper and at East Morling and then um, the technical team at East Morling and Suzanne and Sharon have been really helpful in a lot of technical support for this. Um, as I mentioned, I'm still really looking for as many samples as I can get of aphids. So if you would be interested in sending any, I can send the equipment for it. Um, my email is just at the bottom. If you'd like to send an email. That's Thank it. you very much, Cynthia. It's wonderful. Um, I should have said at the start, and I apologise, I didn't explain that you're not quite as far through your CTP as uh, Sophia or Chris are. Um, so we'll probably be hearing a little bit more from you. It's wonderful that you've come in, I should say, because a lot of people won't know that your um, Cindy and I's father, Bill, is a nurseryman in Surrey producing her basis perennial. So it's wonderful that uh, she has shown an enthusiasm to get involved in horticulture as well, which is great. Um, we have a few questions for you, Cindy and I. Um, one, is it possible for uh, woolly apple aphid to overwinter in crevices on the scion in mild winters? So uh, I would say just from uh, anecdotal evidence, yeah, it is. Um, so in the, I think if, especially if they're more protected. So even I went, when it was really snowy down here in Kent a few weeks ago, I was in the polytunnel and there, they were still above ground on the scion. I know they're protected in the polytunnel, but if they're protected in a crevice, then yeah, I think they can quite easily. Okay, good, thank you. Um, could you please let us know where does the rootstock M26 stand in the resistance graph? Is that something you're able to answer off the top of your head? Just, I don't think it's in there. I don't think we did that one. I think it's, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. I don't, I don't want to say it's just not susceptible in case I get it wrong. I'm sorry. Um, okay. But perhaps that's something you can look into and we can get yeah. back to the question or that is possible. Is there scope for using uh, CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R gene editing to put woolly resistance into existing rootstocks? Yeah, I think that's um, definitely a potential, um, especially for that first gene, because it's probably the best and well-known one. But it's, I think it's still a way off being as well understood as some other genes that are good for CRISPR. But it's definitely would be would be a potential. I don't know. Um, so I don't know if there'd be a market for it. But I don't know if it would be something that would come to in this PhD. But I think in subsequent years, um, that'd be good. It just might need a bit more groundwork. But I think it could be a good candidate. OK, and, and presumably the work that you're doing, you you will connect with the uh, Rootstock Breeding uh, Club at NIRBMR that Feli Fernandez yeah. leads. Yeah. Um, another question, would it be possible to look at resistance to Willie Apple aphid in the scion as well as the rootstock? Yeah, so that's something which um, is, is quite interesting, actually, because you, I, the reason the argument for this work being rootstock over scion is, as I mentioned, you can't obviously control it on the rootstock. It's easier to control on scion. I think going forward in a kind of wider woolly apple aphid resistance breeding program, I think looking at scion would be, um, I mean, fairly intuitive, isn't it? It can get really, really bad with it. But I think possibly the, uh, I can't think of any, um, I don't know a lot about scions, but I can't think of any particularly good um, scion varieties which have resist, you know, have like mentioned resistance. Um, I think Golden like golden Delicious, for example, I think is horribly susceptible. Would, would Rob um, like to answer that question? I, the, when you're looking for a scion type uh, variety, the other parameters, uh, up to now about yield, flavour, um, cropping characteristics, um, they've all taken priority and I don't think, uh, I don't know of anyone who in their breeding programme has has selected for uh, woolly aphid resistance. Okay, um, well there's a slightly related question, this will be the final question because we must move on. Um, do interstocks have any effect on susceptibility? So we've talked about rootstocks, we've talked about sign, what about interstocks? I'm afraid I don't know. I have um, I have no idea if they do. I know that there is um, so it's not me down for Willie Apple for resistance, but there is some reports of resistance genes from one or the other being able to pass into the other one. And I was wondering about I don't know the effect that an interstock would have on that, um, whether or not it would be able to have any of those um, like transferable resistance between the elements. I have no idea, I'm afraid. Okay, 
Okay, um, we must move on because we're running late again. Cindy and I, thank you. We will definitely be hearing from you again um, and good luck with the rest of your project and thank you for such a clear talk as well. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Yeah, thank, thank you, Rob. Okay, so we're going to move on now. Um, we've worked, a, uh, we're working a really hard today. Poor Selena is up again. <laughs> Um, I, I talked earlier on in my presentation at the start of the afternoon uh, about work we've been doing on enhancing beneficial, the influx of beneficial insects into newly planted orchards and I just briefly outlined some of the results we've had so far. We've managed to fund a third year of this so despite C the project TF223 coming to an end we've managed to, to, to fund some more uh, at NIIBMR and Celine's going to tell us what she's found during this last, uh, well throughout the project and particularly last year. Celine. Yes, thank you, Scott. So I will do my best to summarize three years of this of this project and uh, try to give you the the best information. So this project started actually in 2017. So that's when we sowed the alleyways in the apple orchard, mm. and then we waited for one one year until we could uh, assess uh, the the sites. So first, why why we started doing this? Um, obviously, setting up a new orchard is a great investment, and and after treating the soil and planting the trees, there is a bare uh, ecosystem there. So if you don't have uh, natural enemies, if you don't have beneficials, it's very easy for pests to just go in and and attack your orchard and attack your fruit, and that's why we wanted to see if we could uh, accelerate the, the, the ecosystem, the build, building up your beneficial populations. So by doing interventions, we were hoping we could increase that, increase the beneficial, increase the natural enemies. So what did we do? Uh, we looked at uh, one quarter of an hectare in each, in each block and we had six blocks, five of them in Kent and one in Suffolk. Um, and what we did on this quarter of vector was plant uh, wildflowers alleyways. And we also did the deployment of wig nests. And we also, during the season, uh, deployed of a fry attractant. Uh, the alleyways were targeted uh, for pollinators and natural enemies like parasitoids and tocorids and wig nests that were first uh, targeting ear, uh, earwigs uh, also serve for spiders, ladybirds, and we also found antocorids in them. Uh, Overflies are predators and are also pollinators, so they serve both. So what we did in 2018 and 19. So we looked at ground coverage, so establishment of the florals, uh, floral alleyways. We looked at solitary bees. We looked at aphids on, on, on trees. We looked at the wig nests and, and what was using them. We looked at uh, natural enemies on trees. We looked also at midge damage, at pests and predatory mites. We looked at the fruit damage in, in in summer and in autumn and we also did the night assessment for the earwigs and again the overfly uh, attractant deployment. In 2020 we had to uh, shorten our protocol and cut some of the of the work so we continued monitoring our floral uh, establishment uh, we, we continued doing uh, aphid uh, surveys, but we had a special focus on woolly apple aphids uh, last year. We also continued monitoring the wig nests, the, the natural enemies on the trees, and looked at fruit damage and the overfly abundance. So starting with the wildflowers, so like I mentioned in the, in the plum presentation, uh, 2018 was the first year after sowing, so one year later we can see that site 6 had only 22% of establishment, other sites uh, had much higher establishment, uh, but through management we can see that site 6 increased and three years later it has now 60% of establishment of wildflowers. So it, this highlights how how well your 
wildflower area can do if you manage it properly. So we we do multiple cuts in the first year, about six to seven centimeters, not higher than that, and then one cut after that each season. September, October would be the best, but many orchards we work with need to access the site for harvest, so it's impossible to leave it to that long. So some of them cut right before harvest, and it has worked uh, this way. And uh, the seed mix has continued establishing throughout the three years. So here you can see uh, on your right, you can see the difference between control and intervention. So these are the same sites. If you look, this picture is the control. At the same site, this picture is the intervention. You can clearly see the difference. There's a lot more diversity in there. Um, so just the main uh, species that uh, plant species that that were present in 2018, intervention had red clover, yarrow, and control had grasses and white clover. Uh, in 2019, we still had white clover, yarrow, and we now had common knapweed. So those are all uh, species that are in our seed mix. Uh, again, control had quite a lot of grasses. Uh, control always have lots of grasses, of course. Uh, wild clover and plantain, plant, plantago uh, genus. In 2020, uh, we we recorded a bit more of non-competitive non grasses, which are part of our mix, and we still had yarrow and common knapweed. Again, control grasses, white clover, and uh, plantago genus. So summarizing uh, a bit what we found in the three years. So I'm just gonna focus on the green, which is a positive effect. So it's either an increase in natural enemies or beneficial or a decrease in your pests when you compare the floral alleyways to the unsown. So it's an, uh, an increase in beneficials in the sown area and a decrease of pests in the sown area. So for overflies, we detected an increase of overflies in 2018, but we couldn't replicate that in 19 and 20. For fruit damage, we, we had significantly uh, a reduction of codling moth damage, uh, both in summer and also in the dropped fruit uh, in autumn. In 2019, we again uh, uh, recorded a reduction of codling moth uh, damage in, in trees in autumn. This year, uh, it was there was very little damage of codling moth in the sites we visited, but we did record a decrease of tortrix uh, damage uh, on the plots that were treated with floral waste and weakness. Uh, in relation to aphids, we had a significantly reduction in 2018, but that didn't, uh, we didn't uh, reported that or recorded that the other years. In fact, this year, last year, we had uh, higher numbers of aphids in in uh, sown areas. So, and like I said, we focused uh, especially in woolly apple aphid, and we got also uh, a significantly increase in floral areas. Although this is only on two sites, so of our six sites. Four of them didn't have woolly apple aphid or was not significant. Uh, tree tapping. Uh, we, we recorded a higher number of lace wings in 2018 in summer. We also recorded more predatory spiders in 2019. And this year, we had both more lace wings, more antochorids, so an increase uh, of, of uh, natural enemies uh, in in the alleyway, uh, in the floral alleyway plots. Um, with the night assessment for earwigs, we didn't record any significant difference between controls and and uh, unsown areas. For mites, again, very carefully with this data because we only had one site that uh, had presence of uh, fruit three red spider mite, mm -hmm. and it was re uh, significantly reduced in the, in the floral alleyway. 
in 2019, we looked at spiders and we were able to identify them to families. So the most abundant uh, was orb weaver spiders, they're predatory spiders, and, and there was, although not significantly more, but there were slightly more in the treatment area than in control. We also recorded significantly more money spiders that feed on soft body uh, insects in areas where we had the alleyways and the weakness. We can also say that we had adults from foliage and sac spiders that also feed in small insects and uh, we only recorded adults in the weakness so they seem to be using that as a refuge. Uh, looking at the weakness, so opening the weakness and looking at what was using them, what was seeking refuge in them. In 2018, we had spiders and earwigs. In 2019, we added anthocorids, also uh, using them as refuge. And this year, we had spiders. We also uh, recorded quite a lot of nests, uh, spider sacks in, in the, in the weakness. We also recorded earwigs and ladybirds uh, for this year. Probably uh, ladybirds because slightly a different time of the year when we did the, the monitoring. So in conclusion, so this, this presentation is already a conclusion of the three years that we, that we uh, did the trial. But mostly is that wildflower can be successfully uh, established if if management uh, is, is proper. And we were able to reduce fruit damage, also increase natural enemies in some seasons and years. Uh, but this just highlights how important it is to keep monitoring because the wildflower mix changes. It's either still growing and it will change. This year was the first year we actually had uh, a negative effect from aphids, so it's it's it is very important to know where does it go from here and and to continue monitoring those uh, floral uh, alleyways. So for future work, we are still using those sites for pollinator and pollination surveys under the B uh, the Bespoke project. We will keep monitoring those flower uh, alleyways. What we are uncertain is about pest surveys. Uh, so we are just waiting on to know if we still have funding to do that. And well, thank you for listening and I hope uh, you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, Celine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the crucial thing, isn't it? We need to do this over a number of seasons. Um, Rob, Rob's sitting here listening. How, how difficult would it, would it be to do a cost benefit analysis on something like this, Rob, do you think? Is that been a very difficult task to do? Because that might, a lot of growers would want to try and weigh up the benefits and the costs of these things. I think it's, uh, I think it's extraordinarily difficult to do a cost benefit analysis, but we've got to a stage, I think, where instead of thinking like chemists where you make intervention A and you get outcome B, we, not, we need to start thinking like biologists and we're managing populations of stuff out there, um, which is massively more complex. Uh, and it's, it's still a young science, but um, uh, the, the, you're, right, you're right, Scott, um, getting a crisp uh, satisfaction that, that there's a, a cost benefit analysis is um, we're still some way off. Yeah. Yeah, OK, um, we need to move on, but we've got a few comments here, which I'll try and read out if I can. Uh, somebody's saying that it is interesting that in the young orchards that have typically have low levels of beneficials, the flower mixes and wig nests seem to give a good boost to the populations of lacewings, anthocorids, spiders, earwigs and so on. And that does result in some improved lepidoptera control. Do you have any thoughts on the reason why the aphids were more prevalent next uh sorry why the more pre prevalent the following year was it the higher pressure that we had last year due to the mild winter Does sorry can you repeat that <laughs> um <laughs> do you any have any thoughts on the reason why the aphids were more prevalent uh the following year was it the higher pressure that we had due to the mild winter uh there we there are some uh indications 
that they they might use the 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 wildflowers, but but we didn't record that before. Uh, so that's why we were looking specifically at woolly apple aphids this year. But to to say I we needed more more monitoring to to get to a conclusion if that is the case. Okay. Um, Michelle's just dropped in a line saying it's so important that if these become part of elms that we understand the long-term effects and if, they are, uh, if there are any negative effects from pests and diseases. So I think it's all sort of wrapped up in what you were saying, Rob. Um, there's a long, it's long-term work here. It's, it's, very, it's very much in its early stages. And like the work that Zhang Ming and Chris Cook were talking about earlier on, uh, it's a very, very complicated ecosystem involved in here, which, which we need to learn more about as we move on. Um, and, and talking about moving on, I think we must have to move on to the next question, if we uh, the next uh, presenter. So, Celine, thank you so much for doing not just one but two excellent presentations today. You can take a bow, have a rest, and uh, the um, yeah, you, you you can sit back and put your feet up and have a drink. <laughs> thank you very thank much you. indeed, and thank you, Rob, for just now. Thanks. Um, Thanks so we're thank we're staying with pests, and we're moving on to spotted wing drosophila. Um, and those of you that have uh, attended this event in recent years will know that SWD has taken uh, a large chunk of this, this event in the past and it continues to do so because it's so important to particularly cherry and plum growers. Um, we've got three SWD talks for you now. We're going to start off with Christina, Christina Conroy, who I think is probably known to most of you who have been listening into these talks in recent years. Um, another CTP student, so she's the fourth this afternoon. She was in the uh, first recruitment, uh, so she's just coming like Sophia, she's coming to the end of her uh, PhD. So she's going to tell us all about the work she's been doing on a push-pull strategy, or particularly the push aspects, looking at repellents for SWD. Christina. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Christina Conroy. And as uh, Scott said, I am a fourth-year PhD student um, working with the CTP. Now, due to the limited time constraints today, I'm going to be focusing the majority of the talk here on uh, the work which I've been doing on repellents. I'm also going to point out at this time that should anyone wish to email me with any questions, the email address I provided is correct. I got married during my PhD and unfortunately the university wasn't able to supply me with another email address with the correct name. So pushing towards a new IPM strategy, Drosophila Suzuki, the search for effective repellents. So I'm going to start off, as I always do, by thanking the people who have made this possible. So to the BBSSC and the AHDB for funding my project, the CTP for providing additional funding and training opportunities, and the internship which I undertook with Berry Gardens last year, which was incredibly useful and has really given me the opportunity to see where it is I want to go in the future. So in terms of the talk structure, I'm going to be starting off by talking about the problem of SWD, the aims of the work which I've been undertaking, the research that I've done and the results which I've attained from this, and then of course finish off with a little bit about the potential future of where the work that I've been doing could go. So Drosophila Suzuki is the major European horticultural pest. Now, the reason for this is that it has a highly serrated ovipositor, which can be seen circled in red um, in the bottom right-hand side of the screen and the female picture. Now, this enables it to cut into ripe and ripening fruit, unlike other UK Drosophila species, which can only lay their eggs in rotting fruit. And then fruit degradation is caused by a larval feeding inside the fruit, causing the fruit to collapse, and secondary infections brought in by the oviposition hole. One of the things that makes this project, I think, so interesting and so exciting for my PhD is the fact that there's two morphal varieties, but of the same species. So there's a summer morph and a winter morph. Now, the summer morph transitions into the winter morph in response to reduced light and reduced temperature. But interestingly, it's the winter morph which is coming into the crop at the beginning of the growing season. Now, these two morphs live in quite different and contrasting almost ecological habitats, 
So the summer morph is found almost exclusively within the crop and the winter morph is found predominantly within sort of the woodland habitat. So would necessarily these morphs respond to semiochemicals in the same way, given that they live in these contrasting habitats? So the overall project aim that I've been doing is to develop this integrated push-pull control strategy for the year-round management of Drosophila suzuki, which is less reliant on pesticides. So the idea here is to use repellents to push the insect from the crop and attractants to pull them into a trap where they die. Now there's been a lot of work done on attractants with multiple commercially available products. In comparison with repellents, very little work has been done. We've even less done on the winter moth and there are no commercially available products at the, on the market right now. So really the aim of my work here was to use a cascade of um, experimental methodologies to, to really work from the ground up and to identify chemicals acting as repellents for D. Suzuki summer and importantly the winter moths as well. So I started off in the laboratory doing some electron tenogram work. Now, for those of you who aren't particularly familiar with EAG, a glass electrode is inserted into the eye of a live Drosophila suzuki, and a secondary electrode is placed into the third antennal segment, as can be seen in the picture. An odor is puffed over that antenna, and the voltage change across the antenna is measured. But simply put, can the insect's olfactory system detect the chemical? Now, the results from this showed that 14 chemicals were detected um, by both the summer and the winter moths. But the graph that I've actually put up here shows um, three chemicals which showed significant, which elicited, sorry, significantly different antennal responses between the summer and the winter moths. So this is just beginning to build up that picture that actually potentially there are some quite significant differences. But of course, just because um, you get an antennal response. This doesn't always necessarily equate to a behavioral response. So it was really important moving forward that we did some bioassay work. Now, my bioassays were great one liter plastic pots. Now, they had two gated traps into them, and I've blown up the gated traps so you can get a better view of it. Now, the two gated traps had an attractive substance on the bottom uh, raspberry juice and yeast volatiles, both known to be very important to the Drosophila Suzuki um, life cycle. And then it had a piece of filter paper held in place with an insect pin. Now onto this filter paper, I could either add a repellent or a control. Within the arenas themselves, there was two gated traps, one control, one repellent. The D Suzuki were added into, uh, through the lid and then left for 24 hours, at which point I came back and I monitored where they were within the pot. Now, this was done for the 14 different chemicals at three chemical concentrations on both the summer and the winter moth. So overall, the result found that seven chemicals were repellent to the summer moth, five chemicals were repellent to the winter moth, but interestingly, only the four chemicals, the one which I've shown in the table here, were actually showing repellency to both the summer and the winter moth. So there are definitely at this point behavioral differences between the two of them. And this is this is really important to consider um, in both the short term and the long term for growers. But of course, the main problem with the work that I've done up until now is the fact that this has all been done in a laboratory um, environment. It's not exactly um, there's not a lot of ecological validity to this. So the next logical step, taking it out into the field or semi field in this case. So these, I had access to 12, 12 meter polytunnels, which were closed ended. I also had green shade netting in the first two experiments that I conducted over the top to provide some shade and increase the Suzuki uh, movement. But to give you a bit more of a bird's eye view of this methodology. So as I said, these are 12 meter polytunnels with one gated red Drosophila Suzuki trap, one meter from each end of the polytunnel. Now, within these Drosophila Suzuki traps was fresh raspberries, and these were to act as um, an attractive uh, odorant, and secondly, as an oviposition substrate. So 
So around one of the Drosophila Kazuki trap was repellent sachets and around the other control sachets. Now these repellent sachets, or the, well, the sachets I should say, were made up of semi-permeable polythene with a piece of dental roll in the middle. The control or the repellent was dispensed onto this dental roll and then they were heat sealed. And um, the idea behind this was so that we weren't introducing any of the chemicals into the dispensers. The D-Suzuki were released from the six metre point in the centre and then left for um, two days. And I did two different experimental methodologies using this method. So the first experiment was um, comparing the four different chemicals that I was using and comparing the summer and the winter moth. And then the second experiment was using the um, same sachet size as the first experiment, so high dose sachets, and then comparing this with a low dose sachet. And these were the results. Now, I appreciate at a first glance, these graphs are quite difficult to read, but what you should be interested in here is if the, uh, the dot, the mean, and the, um, the error bars are on that dotted line or above the dotted line, they were not repellent. If they were below the dotted line, they were significantly repellent. So in this case, three of the four chemicals um, showed significant repellency to the summer and the winter moths. But within these cases, it's still important to consider the fact that there are still significant differences between the summer and the winter moth. And then moving on to the next experiment. So I'll just remind you again that the next experiment used high and low dose sachets instead. And in this case, what was quite interesting is that the high dose sachets acted as we would expect in the first experiment. So they were all significantly repellent to the D Suzuki. However, when looking at the low release sachets, only one of the chemicals, 129-08, was actually effective at repelling the D Suzuki. The main problems which I had with this experiment, which I'm sure most of you have already picked up on this, is the fact that these were done in barren polytunnels. So the next experiment was undertaken in the presence of a crop. So this experiment was conducted in the same 12 meter polytunnels, but this time instead I had strawberry bags down the center of the polytunnel. The repellent sachets were placed around one side of the, um, the polytunnel as can be seen on the left hand side of the screen. And then the D Suzuki were released at the six meter point. I left the D Suzuki in there for one week. And then after that time period, I came back and I did the sampling of the strawberries from the crop itself. So I did this at the seven different sampling points shown. So one meter, two, four, six, eight, 10, and 12. These were the results. So the control was fantastic. Um, it shows that I released the D Suzuki in the middle and then they spread out along the length of the tunnel um, laying eggs. And then we get onto the slightly more exciting results. So clearly here, the results are 129-04 and 08, so the blue and the green graphs. These were actually um, repelling the D Suzuki, so reducing um, the obvious position approximately between four and six meters. So this was um, an excellent example of what um, the repellent could do. Now, unfortunately, the, the orange graph that you can see didn't seem to work as effectively as a repellent pushing the insects away to oviposit. But there was a secondary part to the results gained. So after I looked at these results, I actually went back and totaled the emergence um, and then divided by the polytons to see how many were actually um, D Suzuki were emerging. Now, what was really interesting about this is that 129-13, as you'll just remember me speaking about, wasn't particularly effective at pushing the, um, the other position away from the repellents. However, it did significantly reduce total emergence, and as did O4. Again, interestingly, O8 in the middle, which was effective at pushing the obvious position away, didn't actually significantly reduce the total emergence. Now, there are multiple potential reasons for this. 
So there could be a larval competition inside the fruit, reducing the number which emerge. And the chemical itself could be causing embryo uh, lethality. Or alternatively, um, it could just be acting as an opposition um, deterrent. But I think at this point of the talk, it's really important to go full circle again. A repellent used on its own is unlikely to be um, completely effective when used. So it really needs to be combined with a secondary feature. So in this case, as I said at the beginning, push-pull control strategy. Which leads me nicely onto the future work. Now, whilst this is outside the scope of my PhD, I'm really hopeful that in the future this work will continue with the chemicals that I've found and potentially use something similar to the methodology that I've put out on the screen here. So comparing both um, a push-pull, the attractants and repellents being used in combination and then comparing this to using only the attractants alone or only the repellents alone and ideally then also a control where neither are used. So at this point I'd like to acknowledge all the people that made this possible and made my PhD um, so enjoyable. So my supervisors from um, NRI, the University of Greenwich, Dr. Daniel Brain, Professor David Hall. My supervisors from NIAB, EMR, Dr. Charles Whitfield and Dr. Michelle Fountain. And then special thanks to a whole host of people, but the special mentions today will go to uh, Scott Raffle, Nicola Harrison and um, Harriet Duncalf, who have always been the unwavering voice of support during my PhD. So thank you very much and any questions I would be delighted to answer and any other questions, please con feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. And as ever, thank you for making uh, producing such a clear, easy to understand presentation. Um, we have one question here. Uh, are the chemicals you used commercially available? I think I know the answer to that, but I'll let you answer it. Unfortunately, until this research has been published, which I'm in the process of doing, I can't actually tell you what the chemicals are. But hopefully the next time that you hear from me, I should be able to give you a, a much clearer answer to that. Yeah, thank you very much. It's always frustrating, folks, when uh, we can't divulge these things, but there are lots of lots and lots of good reasons why we can't. And um, but obviously, as soon as we are able to, we we will. Um, quick question, to, another question to you, uh, Christina, is uh, what what have you got any plans to carry on doing any further work on SWD if, uh, after your PhD, or um, is is that something you're going to keep secret as well at the moment? <laughs> I mean, I think there's um, a lot of ways which my future career could go. I've got to admit, I have loved the time which I've spent working on SWD, but I guess it will be a, it will be dependent upon the the jobs that are available um, after I've finished writing up. And I'm really excited for it. I think there's a lot of exciting pests, whether it's SWD or other species that you've heard about today all of which I would love to work on. Okay, thank you. Well, we wish you well. Um, just a comment from uh, Michelle um, Fountain, who's saying the repellents that uh, Christina has identified are being taken forward in cherry orchards this spring for trialling. Uh, obviously, we're going to go on and talk about more SWD matters in a minute. But uh, Rob, uh, anything else to add in terms of this? I, I mean, uh, it, this is so important to the industry that we continue to, to deliver new um, possible control measures, isn't it, for SWD? Any any growers who are watching this and are thinking, well, why are we worried about this? We can just spray them with tracer. No, we can't. Not for not forever. Um, the the history of development of uh, resistance to any insecticides which are used repeatedly um, is uh, is, a, is horribly prescient. And so, developing techniques like this, which uh, don't exert the same selection pressure for uh, for developing resistant types, uh, and also avoids actually applying um, crop protection materials to the crop hugely important it's uh, it's it's another christina another really impressive uh, piece of work thank you okay thank you, thank you uh, christina we must move on um we're going to stick with swd now because this is only part of the story um there's, there's a few pronged attacks that we've got at the moment on swd and repellents is just one of them the next is bait sprays um you've probably heard about this before if you've been at this event in the past ralph noble has uh, informed us before and ralph is back today to talk about the work that he's been doing on on bait sprays uh, as, as a as a new approach to controlling spotted weaver 
Ralph, tell us what you've been finding this last year. Okay, yeah, thanks, Scott. So, yes, I'm, I'm going to talk about the use of uh, bait sprays. Um, what are the objectives of using uh, bait sprays? Um, first of all, to improve the efficacy of existing uh, insecticides that are used against SWD, like uh, Tracer and Exeril. Um, to make other insecticides effective, therefore uh, broadening the range of products that are effective. Um, to spray onto the foliage of the crop and attract the SWD, uh, SWD away from fruit. Um, to reduce pesticide residues and resistance, um, and, um, by using a bait, we get the pesticide inside the pest um, and therefore get a more effective dose. Um, and to minimize the effect of pesticides on beneficial and non-target organisms. So um, just to uh, uh, summarize how we got to this position, first of all, we started off with uh, laboratory scale experiments comparing different bait, potential bait materials. This um, graph shows the results of using this uh, Drosophila activity monitoring, monitoring apparatus, which is a series of tubes. Um, each tube contains a small sample of bait. Uh, and it's put inside a cage of SWD, so they can fly in and out of these tubes. And uh, there, there are um, uh, electronic monitoring devices for uh, counting the number of times flies go in and out of these tubes, so that the more attractive materials get more, more visits. So um, you can see on this graph, uh, the most attractive materials were uh, SJ, strawberry juice, and a suspension of this uh, yeast, Hansenia sporum uh, uvarum. Um, um, other materials um, were uh, less attractive, but more attractive than just a sugar solution. Um, these included uh, gasser liquid. Gas is used as an attra um, as a attractant in uh, traps. It's not really suitable as a bait. Um, it's too acidic and uh, scorches the leaves. Um, so, and, and this leaves two other materials, uh, Combi Protect, which is a, a commercially available uh, bait for SWD and uh, molasses. So um, in, in 2019, we did the first uh, semi-field scale experiment with baits um, using um, Combi Protect and this uh, yeast suspension. Um, and uh, we used the uh, insecticide uh, Benevia uh, which is uh, cyanotrinilipril. Um, so you can see here in the, this is a graph showing the adult emergence per berry following um, uh, these different treatments um, in, the, in the weeks following uh, application. So the, the green bars show the untreated uh, strawberries. So um, the, these were uh, infested in all, all of the weeks. Um, the uh, uh, red bars show the effect of the full rate of uh, Benevia. So uh, good control using the full rate of Benevia. And um, the yellow and blue bars are the bait treatment with only 4% of the uh, Benevia. So we've got good control uh, in all weeks um, using the 4% um, uh, insecticide rate as good as with the um, Benevia. Certainly the Combi Protect is as good, was as good as the uh, Benevia. Um, we didn't follow up on the uh, the yeast suspension. It's more difficult to use than a than a readily available material like Combi Protect, and it was slightly less effective. Um, so we we didn't follow up on that. So um, in in uh, 2020 experiment on uh, raspberry, we uh, compared dilute rates of uh, tracer, uh, tracer and Exeril uh, with and without baits um, against the uh, full field application of these insecticides. Um, raspberries were um, under semi-field conditions, so um, in, in the, um, the, the, the uh, polytunnels that uh, Christine has already uh, described. And we examined the effect on uh, D. Suzuki control and pesticide residues in the top, middle and bottom of the uh, raspberry plants. So these were the uh, treatments. So again, we had an untreated control. And then um, Four insecticide uh, sprays. Uh, these were alternating two tracer, alternating with two um, exeril. Um, so the full field rate application was 500 liters per hectare equivalent. And then the, um, the low rate sprays were either with baits, um, Combi Protect or molasses, or the low rate of insecticide without the um, uh, bait added. 
Um, so the combat protect, as I say, is, an, is authorized for use as an adjuvant um, in the UK, and uh, molasses is not an authorized product and was used here uh, just for comparison. So this, uh, this just shows the uh, facilities um, and the raspberry plants that were used in the experiment. Um, you can see on the bottom left pictures, uh, the bait sprayer are as distinct droplets, whereas the full spray is a more um, even application uh, um, of the uh, spray. I'll, I'll say a bit more about the measurement of the um, spray coverage uh, at, the, at the end of the um, presentation. So uh, this just shows um, how the bait and full spray applications uh, differed. So um, the bait was applied with a, uh, a lecular nozzle. Uh, the full rate was applied with an orange albus pollen cone nozzle. Um, the bait was applied as a one meter band across the middle canopy of the raspberry plants, whereas the full rate was applied to the entire canopy. Um, the bait was in a low volume, 40 liters per hectare, compared with uh, 500 liters per hectare equivalent for the, the full rate. And um, the concentration of um, insecticide in the bait sprays was much uh, lower than in the full rate. So the, uh, as I say, we only used 4% um, of the insecticide with the bait spray. So a combination of a lower concentration and a lower spray volume compared with the full rate spray. Um, the bait sprays uh, with that lecular nozzle have a slightly higher, a slightly larger droplet size, 340 microns compared with 200 microns for the um, uh, orange albus uh, cone nozzle. So uh, this shows the results of the um, uh, sprays on raspberry plants. Uh, the uh, the uh, this is in terms of uh, emergence of uh, D Suzuki adults from uh, uh, harvested raspberry fruit. Um, so again, the green bars show the untreated controls. So um, uh, a sizable number of uh, adults emerging from untreated fruit in all of the uh, sampling weeks. Um, the grey bars show the lower rate of uh, insecticide, just applying 4% of that full rate. So there is some uh, there is some control effect of the low rate, but it reduces it to about 50% of the untreated control. Um, we can see, uh, again, the full rate of these uh, insecticides has given good control in uh, all the sampling weeks, uh, but we've achieved equally good control with the bait uh, treatments, the combi protect and the molasses. So even though we've only used 4% of the insecticide, we've achieved um, equally good control as we did with the, um, the full rate of these sprays. Um, this shows the, uh, uh, the same experiment that ex uh, expressed uh, in terms of larvae um, from a flotation test. So just a different measure of um, measuring these treatments. Um, the, uh, the brown arrows show where um, the tracer was applied and the black arrows show where the XRL uh, sprays were applied. So um, as I say, alternating, um, uh, alternating these insecticides. Um, these these numbers are slightly lower than from the emergence test uh, because uh, it, it doesn't pick up the um, the eggs in the fruit and the and the very small larvae that are lost in the the trash from the um, the raspberry fruit. So the, these numbers are slightly lower than than we got in the um, adult emergence from the from the same uh, batches of uh, samples. Um, but again, you can see the green bar the green line is the untreated control. That, that um, progressing through the weeks, the, um, the the gray bar is the low rate of insecticide. It's slightly lower than that, and then um, the full rate and the bait sprays have given very good control uh, up to two weeks past the uh, the final spray. Um, the um, the bait sprays then uh, sort of switch off in terms of control. The the lines go up at the same rate as the um, the control treatment at, at week five. Uh, there is some residual um, efficacy of the full rate spray, um, I, I, it's debatable whether the, having a low rate of um, residual insecticide on the crop is a good thing uh, rather than just a complete loss of efficacy. Um, what, what isn't debatable is the much lower um, uh, residues of insecticide we find in the bait spray treated fruit. So you can see um, across the top, middle and bottom uh, of the plants, fruit taken from those positions, um, the residues of spinosad are much um, higher than from the uh, the combi protected molasses um, sprays. Uh, they're, they're about at least 11 times higher 
in the full field rate than in the um, the bait sprays, and that there isn't a significant difference between the two two baits. Um, we see the same trend with um, cyanotrinilipril residues um, immediately after the uh, the second exeral spray. Again, the full field rate much higher fruit residues than in the bait spray uh, treatments. Um, the, the the top you see there the uh, fruit tank from the top of the plants um, slightly exceeded the um, uh, maximum uh, residue level um, for cyanotrinilipril, but that, that's of course because we took the fruit immediately after spraying. It wasn't after the um, the normal harvest interval. Um, this uh, this final graph shows the um, the spray coverage. Um, um, that was obtained following these different uh, treatments. So the, um, this, this shows the spray coverage using a fluorescent uh, dye um, that was sprayed. Um, it, um, in, in what was added to the spray, so we could we could trace where the uh, the, the spray droplets uh, were on the leaves. So it shows the um, the top of the canopy, the top third, the middle third, and the bottom third of the canopy, and the uh, the upper and lower side of the leaves. Um, so the um, you can see the uh, the standard rate or the full field rate spray. This is the orange bar, so there's pretty even uh, distribution or um, coverage of the leaves, at least 50% coverage in all of those positions, um, whether it's the top of the leaf or the bottom or the top of the plant or the bottom, a pretty um, um, uniform level of spray coverage, um, at least 50%. Uh, you can see from the... Um, the, the low rate or the bait sprays, though, most mostly that's going on the middle canopy and on the upper side of the leaf. And, and that, of course, is to be expected. The, um, the baits were applied as a band spray and um, uh, most of that's gone on the upper side of the leaf. Very little, um, very little spray going on the bottom of the leaves or on the top of the plant or the bottom. But um, in spite of this um, uneven distribution of the bait spray, we've achieved equally good um, control of SWD in, in, in fruit taken from all positions on the plant. So uh, th this is a big advantage. We don't need to achieve uniform um, application of the bait spray um, to get very good control of SWD from all positions on the, uh, the raspberry plant. So it, it makes spraying uh, much easier. So uh, just to conclude, the uh, dilute applications of Tracer and XRL with baits were as effective as the full field rates. So um, uh, that's involving an insecticide application reduction of 96%. Um, all the treatments remained effective for uh, two weeks after the last spray, um, but the full field rate showed some residual effect for longer than the bait sprays. Uh, the pesticide residues were at least 11 times higher uh, in the full field rates than uh, bait spray treated uh, plants, and the um, of course the, um, the, um, the the bait sprays involve a reduced cost and an environmental impact of pesticides. Um, there's there's less much less insecticide involved in using bait sprays than using uh, full field rates. Um, the spray coverage of the low rate sprays was at least eight times lower than the full field rate. So uh, we, we don't need to achieve good coverage of the crop or very uniform coverage of the crop to get good uh, control from all positions on the plant. Um, I should say this experiment was in um, uh, full enclosure, so it, it, didn't, um, it didn't involve any looking at any effects on beneficial or non-targets insects. These were excluded uh, from the experiment. So um, we've shown this. Um, this method is very effective in soft fruit, and uh, the next steps will be to see how effective this uh, bait treatment is in, in tree fruit, such as uh, cherries. So um, if there are any questions on that, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you very much, Ralph. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming in here, but before I deal with any of that, uh, and we have got limited time, I, first of all, I would say that all, all of what uh, Ralph has presented uh, has been done on an experimental tri trial basis and a small, uh, on a very small scale. 
Um, we are planning to do more work on cherries uh, this, this coming year. Uh, again, that will be on a trial basis, but we do need to, if we're going to make this into a reality um, for, for growers in future, we do need to do an awful lot more work. And my, my research manager colleague, Rachel McGauley, uh, has put a plea out to anybody out there, any cherry, cherry growers who might be willing to get involved with this to try and help to develop this further for future. Uh, please contact Rachel or, or get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with Rachel. Um, the other thing I should say as well is we're not actually from this work so far. It's it's trials. Uh, we're not currently encouraging growers to use these products in this way, but we are doing a lot of work to investigate the regulatory and agronomic implications of this application method. And we're collaborating with um, scientists on that, some commercial companies and the authorization holders. So there's a lot of work going on in this in the background. So I think it's really exciting. Um, and But it's something that obviously we're not promoting to growers to use this at the moment, but we are um, looking into the regulatory uh, opportunities for doing so. Um, there are a few questions. We've, we've not got time to do them justice because there's some very lengthy messages uh, here, Ralph, and I may need at some point um, to forward these to you and to get you to take okay. them up individually. Uh, okay. So I apologize if I can't deal with other, all of them um, at once, but just generally, uh, first of all, um, do you think a limited cover, I think you've answered this already, but I'll ask it again. Do you think a limited cover from a bait spray would leave fruit vulnerable to SWD attack when you consider that the SWD does tend to prefer fruit to anything else? Um, that's not the case from the uh, raspberry experiment where you, you, you've seen that very um, uneven uh, distribution of the spray coverage. And, and we did sample fruit from the top, middle and bottom of the plants and there was equally good control. Didn't matter whether it was a top fruit or the bottom fruit. I didn't show the, uh, the, the, the differences between the top, middle and bottom, but it didn't show anything. We got good control everywhere. Okay. Um, well, you, you can see that from the averages. The averages are next to nothing. So, you, you know, it's obvious that they're all going to be next to nothing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Another quick one here. How many berries were included in a sample of fruit when assessed for SWD emergence? Um, well, there are six. Yeah, a lot. Because there's six replicates in the experiment and then each replicate, uh, 25 berries from each replicate. So, um, 150. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and, 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 each, and each week, in each week. Yeah. Another and that, question. Uh, Sorry, that's just oh, for emergence, and then at the same number for larvae flotation, so 300, yeah. Okay, and another question relating to numbers. How many larvae have been detected per fruit on average, on average in untreated controls? Is that a number uh, you've got? The... Uh, yeah, it was about 30. I think it was about 25 right. to 30. Yeah, okay. 25 to 30. Yeah. Um, and another general question is a lengthy one here, but I'll just uh, briefly, uh, there's a few that are dealing with this, but somebody asking what the safety of all of this is to uh, honeybees or other pollinators. Uh, yeah, that, 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 um, that's something that needs to be looked at further. Um, I, I know there's, uh, there's data on Combi Protect that shows uh, it, it, it's harmless to honeybees. There's been uh, work done in Germany. So uh, Combi Protect has no effect on honeybees. It's not attractive to honeybees. So um, um, yeah. they, they go for the flowers. I mean, honeybees are interested in the flowers on strawberries and uh, raspberries. The, 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 I, I haven't seen any honeybees going to uh, leaves with bait spray. Uh, a very tiny amount of bait spray. They're, they're going for the flowers. Okay. Thank you. I, I mean, there's a few others. What, the other, just to, to make the point about cherries, a few comments coming in about cherries. Yeah, they, they are go, we are going to be looking at cherries uh, this year. Uh, and as I said earlier, we, we do plan to scale this up because we need to scale it up to get more information in terms of uh, dealing with the, the regulatory hurdles that we'll have to go jump jump over uh, on this. Um, I, I have to stop it there. I'm sorry that I haven't maybe answered everybody's questions in full. What we will do is put a lot of these to, to Ralph and uh, give Ralph your uh, email addresses and get Ralph to contact you directly. I'm sure you'll be happy to help out with that, Ralph. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, sure. Sorry, Rob, I'm not going to be able to bring you in on this one, I'm afraid, because we really must move on. We've got a little bit behind, but... Uh, uh, we, there is one more SWD to talk to come. So if you've got anything else to, to add in, we can do that afterwards. So Ralph, uh, Rob, thank you for, for now. Um, so as I say, we're on a third SWD presentation now, and we uh, invite Adam Walker, who again works with Michelle Fountain and the entomology team at NIAB MR. To, to present to us. Adam uh, has been working on overwintering populations of spotted wing Drosophila, and this is a very practical approach to ways of managing the pest. Uh, I'll let Adam tell you about what he's been doing. 
Okay, thanks very much, Scott. So yes, today uh, I'm going to talk about reducing, sorry, overwintering populations of SWD. So currently, most control of SWD can occurs during the growing season, but there's great potential to control the pest outside the growing season when populations are more vulnerable. I'm going to talk about a trial that we've been running since October 2019, testing a strategy called precision monitoring in woodlands neighbouring soft fruit crops, and this work's been supported by the AHDB. So since 2012, when SWD was first recorded in the UK, we've been monitoring the phenology of the pest in soft fruit crops and neighbouring woodland using monitoring traps. And what our data has found is SWD catches in traps peaks around November time when the uh, cultivated and wild fruit fades and the SWD are hungry and looking for a place to overwinter. Then in springtime, SWD catches are higher in the woodlands as they emerge from their dormancy in search of food and a place to lay eggs. So using this information, our hypothesis is if we deploy a suitable number of traps at the right frequency in these woodlands neighbouring soft root crops from autumn time, we can intercept the SWD before they overwinter. And then if we leave these traps in place during the winter time and into spring, we can intercept the SWD emerging in the springtime. Subsequently, there'll be fewer egg laying females entering the neighbouring soft root crop during the growing season and we can keep precision monitoring in place during the growing season to reduce down invasions. So to test this hypothesis, in October 2019 we set up a trial on six soft root farms in southeast England. Each farm had two small isolated pockets of woodland next to a neighbouring soft root crop. One woodland shown in pink here was designated as a precision monitoring woodland and in it 64 precision monitoring traps were deployed at, in a grid at eight metre intervals. Then the other woodland was designated a control woodland shown in yellow and in that woodland we had no precision monitoring traps. Now to compare SWD counts between treatment woodlands and controls and their respective neighbouring crops, we've used Riga monitoring traps and we've put those in the position marked on the diagram as green fill circles. These Riga traps were put out two weeks before precision monitoring traps were put out originally in October to do a pre-assessment of SWD numbers between their treatment and control positions. And then we've been filtering out the SWD, counting them and replacing the traps at regular intervals since. And this graph shows the results of the SWD catches in the treatment and control woodlands. You've got two lines on the graph. The full line is the control woodland catches and the hash line is the treatment catches. And I'll draw your attention to the arrows. So the first arrow on the left, that's the pre-assessment where numbers of SWD catches were quite similar between treatment and control. And then the second arrow is a month after precision monitoring traps were deployed in treated woodlands. And this is the point where SWD catches peaked in treated woodlands, but they were continuing to rise in control woodlands. After this point, SWD catches were consistently and significantly lower in treated woodlands compared to control up to early July. There's a blue band there and that marks a six week period when precision monitoring traps were removed from treated woodland in the spring of 2020. And during this period, we put sentinel fruit out into all of those positions to monitor egg laying. After that period from early July, we redeployed the precision monitoring traps and Although the numbers aren't significantly different between treated and controlled traps, they're a lot lower uh, than the autumn winter time. Um, they are slightly lower in treated than control woodland still. 
moving on to the comparison of SWD catches in the neighbouring crops. So in general, this graph follows the same trend. The control catches are the full lines and the treated catches are the hash lines and treated catches in the neighbouring crops were lower than control overall. We've also been monitoring SWD catches in the precision monitoring traps using a transect of eight traps in each of the trap configurations in all of the six woodlands. And what we've been doing is emptying these traps at regular intervals and counting the SWD in them. And the top graph here that shows the results from these catches. And this hashback line is comparable to the hashback line on the bottom graph, which is the Riga trap catches again in treated woodlands, just to show that it follows the same trend of catching. Now, to monitor the egg laying potential of the SWD population and compare it between the treatment and control positions, we've been using sentinel fruit traps. And these consist of a delta trap containing fruit to attract D. Suzuki females in to egg lay in the fruit. And then this fruit is left out for about a week and then brought back to the laboratory, incubated for two weeks, and then we count the SWD adults emerging from this fruit. And this fruit was deployed in spring of 2020, then summer and autumn time. And what you can see from the graph is very low numbers of SWD emerging from this fruit. Those are the black bars, but much higher numbers of other Drosophila species. And we think what's gone on here is a competition or a deterrence effect of the other Drosophila species, which aren't enabling the SWD to get a foothold in that fruit. So we're due to deploy sentinel fruit in spring 2020, and we need a new method which exclusively attracts SWD egg laying and development so that we can see if there's a difference between the treatment and the control. We've also been investigating why some traps seem to catch more SWD than others, because it may enable us to advise growers on where best to position, uh, to position precision monitoring to optimise its control. And so we've been running a series of assessments, and one of them is a habitat assessment around each of the traps at all of the sites. And what this involves is we assign the habitat or the vegetation a score according to how attractive it is to SWD, how suitable it is for SWD development, and how much coverage there is. And then we evaluate um, how much of that, and get, uh, we score the area in a four metre radius of all of the traps, and we correlate that to the catches of SWD in those respective traps. And we've run this, we did this in summer, autumn, and winter. And I'm going to show you the results from the summer assessment. And what we found is a significant positive correlation between the habitat score, so and SWD catches. So what that effectively means is where there's more favorable habitat for SWD, you get higher catches. And that was in the summer. We also got a positive correlation in the autumn, but it wasn't quite significant. And we're due to analyze the winter data. So to conclude, overall, we've had fewer catches of SWD in treated woodlands and neighboring crops than control equivalents. Unfortunately, so far, our sentinel fruit hasn't enabled us to determine if precision monitoring can reduce SWD egg laying, and that's because of competition from other Drosophila. So we're investigating a new method of sentinel fruit that should exclusively attract SWD egg laying and development, and ripening fruit is an option being considered. We've found a significant positive correlation between habitat and male SWD catches in traps during the summer habitat assessment and a positive correlation during autumn and we're due to analyse winter. We're also looking at individual host plant species to find out if we can get better resolution on where growers could place their traps, for example around bramble. And as well as those biotic 
factors such as habitat. We're also looking at abiotic factors that we know influence SWD activity and how those correlate to SWD catches in traps, such as temperature, humidity, light intensity, and trap position in the woodland. And once we have all of this information together and analysed, hopefully we'll have a better idea of where to advise growers to position their traps to optimise control with precision monitoring. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks very much for listening. Any questions? Thank you very much indeed, Adam. Um, well, I mean, the one thing I would say is in, in conclusion at the end of those three talks is that uh, some very, very positive stuff's come out. Um, since SWD became a problem in the UK back in, well, it was first found in 2012, but it really started causing big problems from about 2013 and 14 onwards. Uh, AHDB has funded over £1.6 million worth of research into this pest. The first big industry project that we funded came up with some very clear guidelines on things like monitoring, uh, hygiene matters, how, how to detect and so on. Um, and, and this particular project, SFTF145A, which uh, Adam uh, and Ralph have been talking about, uh, has come up with some real positive um, advances in alternative to chemical treatments um, and potentially we hope with a little bit more work and a little bit of help uh, with from, from industry and agrochemical companies authorization holders this could really lead into something very helpful um, so I think it's really very very positive uh, Rob you've been involved with this for some time as well uh, how, how do you see these these two talks from Adam and from Ralph uh, in terms of the what they might mean for growers it's uh, it's just further evidence of the world leading research which has gone on at um, at an IBMR over the last uh, over the last few years, um, and it's just approaching approaching these pests these problems from a different angle, um, and uh, and coming up with more sustainable solutions. I think it's uh, it's another piece of great it's another great piece of work. Yeah, and and Adam, how, what, at what stage in 2021 will you have all these final um, answers or, or the, the final information from this work? So the Sentinel fruit assessments will have all of that data by late June, July time. Um, and so that should give us, as I said, that uh, picture of um, if, if uh, precision monitoring can control egg laying in the neighbouring crop. But we hope to be able to continue this trial because uh, just doing it over one year, you can't necessarily see the long term effects of it. But if we keep continuing it, we might be able to see a knockdown in the population in general over successive years. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's been a theme that's recurring theme from today's uh, presentations, hasn't it? A lot of the work we're doing is, is, is ongoing. Some of it has a cumulative effect and it'd be useful to see how, how that builds up in time. Um, one very quick question for you. Uh, do any of the SWD specialists have a view on what impact uh, SWD numbers will, or, or the impact of the recent snow and frost will have on it on, on numbers. Do you want to add, ask and answer that one, Adam? Yeah, um, so I think um, previously we've uh, it does well, it does have an impact, but the population can bounce back very quickly. <laughs> um, so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a, a, a year where we don't we have low numbers of SWD. We'll have to see what happens later in the year because obviously increased temperatures can increase the, or shorten the population time and increase the number of generations you can get in a year yeah, and therefore and increase think, population sizes. So it's early, to, too early to tell. And I think we know from, from previous research that the, the winter morph is uh, far more better adapted or far better adapted to cold conditions, hence it survives. Um, so uh, I, it'd be nice to think the recent cold snap would have done something, but uh, I think uh, we know from experience it'll, it'll come back again. Um, just one final comment here, really, which is very nice. Somebody's uh, praising us up and saying a huge thank you to the scientists for all the fantastic work that you continue to do on SWD, which is very nice to hear. Uh, I think uh, I should say that my colleague, Rachel Magalia, who commissions the research projects, is trying to work to set up a, a new project which will start this year. Um, so we'll, we'll hopefully be able to continue this work uh, moving into 2021. Um, at that point, let's move on. Adam, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Adam and Chris. Christina and to Ralph uh, for sharing Thank their you. information on SWD. Thank you all.
Uh, and just to reiterate, uh, some of your questions, uh, we will deal with those that we didn't have time to deal with fully earlier. Before we move on to our second last speaker, um, just a couple of things, just looking back to earlier in the afternoon, there was there was discussion about um, the uh, Willy Apple aphid and whether uh, the rootstock M26 uh, or what the susceptibility was to Willy Apple aphid. Somebody's just commenting that they're absolutely certain that it was one of the most susceptible to Willy aphid. So that's interesting to hear. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to raise with you all was the presentation that I gave at the very start of the afternoon. Um, there is a handout on that. And if you look on your dashboard, your control panel on the right hand side, you will see uh, a, a little um, grey bar that says handouts number three. You can find basis and erosive points on there, but you will also find a presentation uh, from me um, summarising uh, the results of the TF223 project, uh, an abbreviated summary. If you want to download that, please do it before the end of the webinar. So we move on. Uh, our second last speaker, um, we are back to the CTP students again. And, and this time we have Carlotta. Uh, and Carlotta uh, Noguer is with us this afternoon. Carlotta has, is also like Sophia and like um, uh, Christina is on her final year uh, of her CTP scheme. Uh, she'll be submitting her uh, report in November. Before her PhD, she worked in a forest nursery in Wales. So that was rather different from what she's been doing of late, but dealing with trees nonetheless, growing a range of forestry trees for forest production and woodland restoration. And her PhD has been split between NIAB, EMR and the University of Reading. Uh, and we've been talking about the winter weather. And of course, we've had, despite a recent cold snap, we've had another mild winter weather. And this is all about the work that Carlotta has been investigating. She's going to tell us all about improving our understanding of winter dormancy in Apple in relation to climate change. Carlotta. Thank you very much, Scott, for the introduction. Um, so um, during the last three years, I've been looking at dormancy and uh, specifically most of my experiments uh, have focused on trying to understand better and quantify the relationship between uh, the, uh, dormancy and bat break to try to um, understand how different apple varieties are going to respond to climate change. So uh, it's quite a dense topic uh, for this time of day, but I hope I can explain uh, clearly what I've been doing. So I don't need to go into detail on what climate change means for the UK, warmer temperatures both in the summer and in the winter, but also an increase in extreme events, so things like uh, uh, for, uh, uh, heat waves during the winter and also um, late frosts. So uh, that's going to have an effect on apple production in a lot of different ways and one of the ways is by affecting dormancy. So dormancy is the temporary suspension of any visual growth and it's also a mechanism of survival during the winter months. And it is very important for uh, fruit production because it determines the time of bat break. So this is the picture on the left. I took it uh, a couple of weeks ago here at Now Year BMR. Um, and also, apart from uh, determining the time of bat break, uh, dormancy also determines the quality. So uh, trees that have not received enough chilling, like the two pictures on the right, uh, bat break, then it's uneven. We've got uneven flowering, and then the final production of smaller and abnormal fruits. So, Dormancy uh, is an annual cycle. Uh, at the beginning of autumn, af as temperatures start reducing, that induces what is known as endodormancy. So at this point, trees are unable to uh, grow because there's physiological blocks inside the bud itself that inhibit growth. And a certain amount of chilling is required to uh, remove these blocks, and that's known as chill requirement. And it usually happens at some point at the beginning of winter. So after that, um, trees don't grow, uh, the trees become what is known as ecodormant. So they don't grow because the temperatures outside are still too cold. So then after that, a certain amount of warmer temperatures or a certain amount of heat is required for the buds to be able to open. Um, and this whole cycle in most fruit trees is regulated by two things, photo periods, so day length and also temperature. But in the case of apple, it's only temperature, and that makes this crop especially vulnerable to any changes in the climate. 
Uh, and as I said, there's two different uh, temperature processes that are going on um, uh, during dormancy. One is this chilling accumulation during the winter, and then this warmer temperature effect during the spring. And we can use uh, modeling uh, to create two different models and then combine them to determine and to predict this time of butt break. And what is uh, key is that this relationship between temperature and butt break uh, is cultivar dependent. So it's not just different in every fruit tree, but also between varieties. So in the case of apple, as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, uh, the chilling requirement between different apple varieties goes from 300 to more than 1,000 chill hours. So I'm going to start by talking about an experiment. I'm going to focus on this experiment where I looked at this first part of the dormancy process, so at the chilling accumulation. Uh, there's a lot of different chilling models that already exist. And these chilling models are important because it's um, when we think about the chill requirement of a variety. So if we're thinking about uh, choosing a cultivar that requires 700 chill hours or a thousand, um, this number, this number of hours, can be calculated in a lot of different ways. Um, if we look at the first models that existed, they, they were developed. The first one was the below seven degrees model. It was developed in 1950, and it was done for pitch. And it was thought at the beginning that any temperature below a threshold, so in this case between below seven degrees, contributed to chilling in a, in the same way. But it was soon observed that that was not the case. Uh, so then the Utah model appeared, and there's a few others that has, have been developed afterwards. So the Utah model is the most commonly used. So when we think about the chill requirement for our trees, often uh, they ha it has been calculated with this. And it assumes that there is an optimum temperature around six degrees and that any temperature between zero and 15 contributes to chilling as well, but in a reduced way. So this model was developed in the States and it was developed for peach, uh, but it is used for any other tree fruit. Um, and as I said earlier, um, this relationship between temperature and butt break is cultivar dependent. So really what we need is to Reparameterize this model for different varieties. And that's what I've done with my, one of my experiments. So I looked at um, two different apple varieties. I had Braeburn and Discovery. So Braeburn, it's known uh, to be a very um, late apple variety, whilst Discovery is a very early one. And I had the trees at uh, eight different chilling temperatures, going from minus four all the way up to 10 degrees and three different duration, durations of chilling. So one, two, and three months of chilling. So I had the trees under chilling. I moved them into the glass house, and then in the glass house, I, uh, I assessed butt break. So not only the timing of butt break, but also the quality uh, of butt break. And I'm just going to talk about the timing of butt break because I don't have time to go into all the results. So. This is just an overview of the results. So we've got Braven on the left and then Discovery on the right. And on the A X axis, so at the bottom, the duration of chilling. And then on the Y axis, uh, the number of days to butt break. And if we look at Discovery on the right, we can see that the longer the chilling, the less it takes for the buds to open, which is sort of what we expected. But in the case of Braven, this relationship is a lot less clear. So I've plotted the data slightly differently, just so uh, we can look at the differences between chilling temperatures. So now on the x-axis, um, there are the different chilling temperatures from minus 4 to 10. And then the three different columns are the durations of chilling, so one to three months. And then we've got Braeburn at the top and Discovery at the bottom. So if we focus on this first column, so after one month, trees of braver um, buds on those trees open after about 20 days for any chilling temperature. So there was, there was no real differences between trees that had been chilled at 10 degrees or those that had been chilled at minus four. But in the case of discovery, it's a really different story. So there's a, clear, there's a lot of differences between temperatures. So I'm just gonna, um, this is the data now only for discovery. So after one month, it is fairly clear that the optimum temperature is somewhere around minus two degrees. 
So though bats on those streets open really, really fast. So there's almost 40 days different between minus two and 10 degrees. So when the chilling period was really short, just one month, uh, temperatures below zero appear to be the optimum uh, for chilling. And that's quite concerning if we think about the future climate change scenario where winters are likely to be not only shorter, so, but also uh, warmer. So if we go, go back at the, um, the graph I showed at the start or the model, so this is just the representation of what the Utah model is doing. So when, when we're calculating uh, the number of chill hours, we are assuming that the optimum is somewhere around six. But in the case of discovery, it should be more somewhere around here. And this is important because we might be really, really overestimating how much chill uh, are some varieties actually accumul accumulating. So what I've done here, I've calculated the number of uh, chill hours accumulated with both the Utah model and my model for discovery uh, from the start of winter up until today, well, until Monday. Um, for this winter and for last winter. And what we see in this winter is that the difference is between, so we've got still about 300 hours difference between the Utah model and my model. But last winter, that was uh, a lot milder. The difference is huge. It's about 800 hours. So this might not happen, matter that much now because uh, 1,300 hours of chill is plenty uh, of ours for most type of varieties. But if we think about the future when it's going to be warmer and the, the winters are going to be much shorter, then the way how we are calculating this is going to have a huge impact on our choices, or it should. So I'm going to now go back to uh, Braeburn, because as I said, um, the differences in Braeburn are a lot less clear. So after one month, um, Pretty much all trees, it didn't matter the temperature, the buds open at the same time. Um, if we look at temperature just above uh, freezing, so that would be from um, from this towards the right, so the warmer colors, there is a slight decrease um, with time, um, with longer chilling, but, but it's not so obvious. So, and then we've got this, um, the temperatures below zero, that I'll be having a bit all over the place, really. Um, but this lack of, um, of this reduced response to different chilling temperatures in, in the case of Braeburn uh, and the, the, the reduced differences between these uh, between temperatures might mean that there is a bit of a brighter future for this variety under climate change conditions. Maybe. But what I've done as well, so I've mentioned at the beginning that there's these two different components of dormancy. So we've got the chilling uh, during the winter, but also uh, the warmer spring temperatures. So I did another experiment where I focused on this um, site of dormancy. Um, and what I did was I collected branches. This time was not with trees. Uh, I collected branches of different varieties. I'm only going to show Braeburn to follow up uh, with the experiment. Um, but at different time points during the winter. And then I put these branches at different warmer temperatures to try to see the effect of the spring temperatures after different accumulations of chilling. And what I saw, uh, I saw with Braven is that uh, after only two months of chilling, so that would be uh, somewhere around the end of uh, December, uh, more than 70% of the variability in time of outbreak could be explained by warmer temperatures. So although Braeburn seems to have a reduced response to chilling, uh, it seems to have a higher response to warmer temperatures. So uh, this might mean that actually it's, uh, it's more vulnerable to late spring frost. So if there is an increase in temperature somewhere uh, after December, um, that it's likely that the buds are going to open much quicker than in any other uh, apple variety. So I still have um, nine months left of my PhD, and there's still quite a bit of things that I would like to do in the time I've got left. So just a summary of some of the key findings um, so far. So I've managed to identify um, the 
thresholds for the chilling temperatures, uh, which is something that um, wasn't fully known, so different models would use different things. Um, an important thing is that I've seen that the optimum temperature for chilling accumulation is much lower than it was previously thought, which is uh, key when thinking about future climate change. And also, I'm starting to get a better understanding of the relationship between uh, chilling and warmer temperatures. So, um, throughout the PhD, I've collected data from the variety, all the varieties that are here at the bottom, and I'm currently working to combine the data from the different models, uh, from the different experiments to create the final models. And one other thing that I would like to do in the nine months I've got left is actually group varieties that are behaving similar rather than having uh, individual models for individual varieties. And then the last thing I'm doing this year is validate uh, some of these models. So I've got one last experiment where instead of having constant temperatures, I've got day-night temperatures, which is going to give me a more realistic uh, view of, of what's going on. And then finally, I would like to use some field data to validate some of these models. And um, I'm going to do that. So I've got some data on time of outbreak from the field, but only from the last uh, three years uh, since I started the PhD. So I'm going to take this opportunity to ask because I am aware that sometimes in orchards in the field, um, uh, people would uh, spray trees with uh, certain chemicals right before bat break. So if anyone's got uh, data and be, would be willing to share data on the timing of those applications, that could be really helpful because we've got a lot of data on flowering, but it's not quite the same in terms of uh, validating the model. So just to... Uh, finish, I just wanted to say thank you to the CTP and all the funders that have uh, funded this project. Also, thanks to my supervisors, Professor Paul Hadley at Reading and Dr. Mark Els at NIA BMR, and to all the technical staff, both at NIA BMR and the university. And then here are my contact details if anyone would like to get in touch. And I think I've rushed through a bit, so there's probably time for some questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed, Carlotta. Uh, no, that's good. Please do help Carlotta if you can. Uh, fascinating account, and it's really interesting, particularly because we keep getting these mild winters. Uh, I have one question here. Uh, why was discovery used instead of gala or another variety more widely commercially grown? Mm, well, the real reason is that I wanted to use gala, but the um, nursery where I bought the trees at the last minute, they couldn't supply me with Gala. And uh, from all the options that there were available, in Discovery was the more interesting in terms of differences between Discovery and Braven. But this year, I'm using Gala. OK, that's that's good. It's very frustrating, isn't it, when these things happen? But it happens to all yeah. scientists uh, can get let down at the end of the just at the last moment. Um, Rob, uh, Rob, for those of you who don't, who don't know, spent a, a lifetime in black currants as well as tree fruit. Uh, and uh, black currants is also another crop which uh, we fear for its future in terms of winter chilling. Uh, Rob, a huge amount of work has been done on black currants in recent years on, on alternative products to uh, overcome dormancy or to break dormancy. Do you want to say anything about that, which might be of relevance to apples? Um, so. Well, that's a question for on. Rob, but he's go on. He's uh, thinking at the moment. So you're, no, you no, give no, me sorry. reviews. Sorry, well, I, I put was, you on the spot. I was going to say, I was going to say in, in um, we, we started off by looking uh, at uh, the sorts of treatments which are made in, in um, uh, in other parts of the world, in South Africa, where they have pretty warm winters, uh, they were in the habit of, uh, of spraying their trees with uh, with various materials that we would never get registration for in the UK. And in fact, they're busy losing their approvals in uh, in South Africa and, and other territories as well. Um, so we've done a bit of work uh, funded by the by Innovate UK. We ran an Innovate UK project um, and um, developed uh, a number of nutrient uh, cocktails which can be applied to uh, the trees sort of in the late dormant period um, with, with, some quite, with some quite encouraging results. Um, some of the genius insight for that actually came from Gerald Bishop when he was at, uh, at NIAB um, and uh, his insight into the metabolic pathways. Uh, and he was able to think of nutrients which 
uh, which were readily assimilated by the trees and uh, and and really helped even out the bud break. So perhaps Carlotta, there may be hope that it, for those apple varieties which uh, are not getting sufficient winter chill in the future, that may be a, a pathway. Or or is anybody doing any research on that already in apples to break buds when they haven't had sufficient winter chilling? I know that there's work going on in this area in France, and we talk about a threshold, and it's almost we almost talk about it like like it's sort of uh, a switch. There's either enough or there's adequate. Um, in fact, I think it's more of a continuum, and you start to see floral defects with uh, with inadequate chilling. Um, but uh, I, I mean, given given an orchard life. Um, I think actually this is really relevant. The work that uh, the work that's been done, I think, is really relevant for growers to look at and uh, and get hold of the of their climate change projections for their for their own sites uh, for the next 15 years when they're making when they're selecting varieties for planting. Okay, I think we must wrap it up there. But thank you so much, Carlotta, and uh, good luck with the rest of your work. You've obviously been working extremely hard, and you've still got a lot to do by the sounds of it. So uh, we wish you well yeah. for the next few months, and and also we wish you well in securing employment, hopefully in the horticulture industry. But uh, good luck. Uh, thank you, Rob, for now. So we come to the final presentation of the afternoon. Um, last but not least is Richard Colgan, uh, who should be known to most of the tree fruit industry because, like many of the others this afternoon, he has presented many times on this stage. Um, Richard uh, has been leading a project on um, long-term storage of gala and trying to manipulate the fruit dry matter uh, of gala because we know that that seems to influence the storability of, of gala fruit. Um, it was a four year project by memory. Um, it's coming, it's come to an end almost, I think, or it's just coming to an end. And Richard's got to summarize what we've learned from that project. Richard, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Can you see my screen? We can indeed, thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to give this talk. Um, so this, this project is um, a funded as TF225. Um, the project was also involves uh, FAST and NIA BMR and NANSIA. So that what we're trying to do in this project is to understand how we can manipulate root dry matter to improve the storage uh, quality of gala apples, but also the consumer acceptability as well. So, why is fruit dry matter important? So when we talk about fruit dry matter, we're really talking about the carbohydrate component of fruit. Um, and as fruit have very little uh, protein and lipids, it's really the everything except the water. So the carbohydrate we're talking here um, really breaks down to sugar, the starch, and the cell wall fiber. Now this uh, carbohydrate comes into the fruit uh, as translocated, um, via the leaves as photosynthate, and uh, most of that photosynthate is in, in the terms of tree fruit, is in the form of sorbitol, which is a conjugate of fructose, um, with a small amount of sucrose. And this gets translocated into the fruits, but also into branches and uh, roots. So the photosynthate is, um, the fruits are competing for other parts of the plant for, for photosynthate and sugars. So when we talk, when in, in fruits, about 50 to 6 percent of the, um, the fruit, dry, fruit dry matter is actually uh, sugars. So when we talk about sugars, that's sucrose, glucose, and fructose. And with fructose being the predominant sugar, because as I mentioned, sorbitol is the main translocation product, and that is a conjugate of sorbitol. And when it gets into the fruit, it breaks down into, into fructose. But how much of the fruit sugars get, get into fruit is very much dependent on the light interception that the crop is um, receiving during the year growing season and also the crop load um, how much fruit how many fruits are on the tree uh, in relation to the size of the canopy but also it's in competing with shoots and branches and roots for, for that sugar so just to reiterate why fruit dry matter content is important it is actually related to bricks so as i mentioned a lot of the uh, dry matter content is sugars um, so it's not surprising that if you have a high dry matter content fruit, you will have a, a, a fruit a fruit with, with high bricks. 
and some work done in New Zealand. Uh, John Palmer, who was an ex East Morning uh, scientist, he he worked on on this case Gala, and the, the graph in the the left hand side shows you as you increase dramatic content on on the x axis, you get more soluble solids, which is bricks. So there's a good relationship between dramatic content and bricks. But also, more importantly, that it is also a good metric for predicting how much sugar would, would develop in that fruit during store, because at harvest, not all that, uh, not all the um, fruit has developed in uh, sugar has developed in the fruit. So some of that starch is still need to be converted into sugars during storage. And so there's a good relationship they found uh, between six and eight, eight, twelve weeks time uh, during storage, where where we found. Um, um, we found that um, that with uh, increased dramatic content, there was a much better increase in sh in sugars during during um, during storage. So the project funded uh, was to try and see if we could manipulate fruit dramata to see how we could manipulate it in the orchard to improve the um, storage and eating quality of fruit. And the main <clears throat> ways of doing that is really to improve light interception, and it's not surprising that the UK isn't the most sunniest of climes. Um, so the only way thing we can do to improve light interception and radiation use efficiency will help some of that uh, conversion of sugar uh, of, of um, light energy into photosynthates and then into uh, translocation into the fruits. And that can either be done through pruning techniques or additional reflective strips in, in the alleyways. Um, thinning, as you very well familiar, can it, will affect crop load and also the eating quality of that fruit, um, but also how you manage tree growth and through either rootstocks um, or other techniques such as girdling and root restriction have been used too as a way of manipulating the the movement of sugars through the tree, um, in this case preventing some that go into the roots. So one of the first things we did uh, in this project was to understand, try to understand the different changes in fruit dry matter um, over the growing season and to do that we, we went to a commercial orchard um, and we harvested fruit every every uh, couple of weeks during the growing season and then took that fruit from both the top canopy and, and the bottom canopy and we harvested that, harvested that fruit and then brought it back to the lab and they analyzed that for the amount of sugars, the amount of starch and the amount of fiber what you can see on the left hand, right hand side of this graph is that the, the grey bars proportion, which is a carbohydrate, you can see starts to increase as fruits mature. Um, and in proportion, the, 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 um, the starch content goes down. So, um, and also the fiber content in proportion limits. So the idea is understanding whereabouts in this, in this growth phase we can um, actually manipulate the, the crop load through thinning in order to maximize the partitioning of that carbohydrate into the fruits. So we looked at both very early events, so looking at um, uh, initially looking at things like flower thinning and bud extinction, extinction before um, before the um, flowers were formed. Um, but uh, we also looked at uh, thinning during the um, at this period of time, so this is sort of the, normally where you would thin fruit between uh, 10 and 15 mils, uh, and then also late late uh, thinning, which is around 40 mils. So we looked at different uh, thinning strategies across the different seasons. And I'm just going to talk about some of the work we've done more recently, where we've tried to distill some of the better results. Um, so we've so some early work on bud extinction um, and flower th flower thinning didn't really show a great uh, increase in the amount of carbohydrate being partitioned. So they had been left to one side, but they were techniques that we had looked at, and this is fast we're doing this, this work. And we've also looked at very sort of late thinning um, techniques too, which again didn't really um, provide a, a really successful outcome. So in the last couple of years, we, we've started to, to manipulate thinning in that sort of dip in, in the uh, carbohydrate uh, accumulation in the fruit, where fruits are around 10 to 20 mil um, in, in diameter, and not only that, also leaving different numbers of, of um, flowers of, of fruitlets on, on the tree. So looking at other singles across the whole whole tree, 
or having a, a combination of singles at the above um, one and a half meters and doubles at the at the bottom, um, or keeping double double fruitlets at, across the whole canopy. And then what's of, often um, practiced in industry is thinning to size, where we do two thinning events, one at 25 to 30 mils, and a second one to remove any, any small fruits at the 40 mil stage, to remove any fruit that won't meet, meet, meet the final, final size. And on top of that, we also use chemical thinners that are currently available, such as Excellus um, Brevis, applied at the 8 to 10 mil size. So just looking at um, this is 2019 data, but looking at the effect of, of thinning strategies on firstly on the fruit size, because this is quite important. And um, what we found was when we started to thin early, so the 10 to 20 mil um, size, what happened is we shifted the fruit size overall from um, a sort of standard, which has a predominantly um, 60 to 65 and, and 60 to 65 category. Uh, we, we shifted that to more of a 65 to 70 mil. So the singles here, singles and doubles, and doubles here, so that we had a much greater proportion of larger larger fruit. Um, as you might expect, the unthinned fruit has a greater proportion of, of the very small 55 to 60 category. So there's a certain amount of plasticity in, in the orchard. So um, by changing the uh, thinning events, you can you can affect the, the size. Um, what we also found was that with those, well, as you might expect, with the singles across the whole tree, we had a, a significant rise in the amount of fruit weight per, per, per fruit compared to the unthin control. Um, and similarly, when we had the doubles, doubles at the bottom and the top, uh, singles at the top, then this was um, an also effective way of increasing fruit weight. Equally, doubles across the whole canopy seemed to also benefit um, increased fruit weight. However, some of the chemical thinners were did not actually increase fruit weight significantly compared to the controls. And if you look at the grade out, and unfortunately this data wasn't significant, but there was a general trend of when you um, thin fruit, generally, as you might expect, you should get more class one fruit, uh, better sized fruit, for example. Um, there was a slight dip in the brevis treated fruit, and I'll explain why that was. Um, the yield per tree per thin fruit was lower, there was less fruit in the tree, but um, that was made up for generally by improving the, the weight of class one, so having more class one fruit available. And if you look at, at what that means to the actual quality of that fruit at harvest, so um, we were, it wasn't as success, so successful in raising dry matter content as we expected, but the singles, because there are fewer fruit, did raise dry matter content. Um, and, and interestingly, the standard thinning process also raised dramatic content. Um, but what was more interesting was the thinning to size had a much more effect of um, improving fruit quality at harvest across a whole range of categories. So not only did um, it improve the dramatic content, but it also increased the bricks. Um, interestingly, the thinning, process, thinning activities also um, increased maturity based on internal ethylene concentration. So Generally, if you thin fruit, the fruits were more mature at harvest. Um, and this is also based on the starch content. So that, um, so, so that, that's one category. And also they had greater sugar, sugar content, um, sucrose content. So thin, thinning to size generally was a much, much preferred um, method of improving fruit quality uh, over all those parameters. And we talked about being a, a poorer grade out in some of those category uh, thinning treatments. So the control, as you might expect, had uh, only a much number, a greater number of smaller fruit. And in the brevis um, treated fruit, we had a greater category of disease fruit, interestingly, which, which reduced the amount of marketability of that fruit. So when we stored some of that fruit, we also want to look at uh, how that was uh, impacting on um, the store quality. And, and so we stored some of that fruit for about six months in five and one at uh, half to one degrees. And what we found was that um, fruits that had, had high matter content in, um, in the, at the harvest um, led to uh, a great amount of sugars being accumulating in the fruit during store. So, so again, the, the size, the size um, thinned fruit, fruit thinned to size. Had a hydromatic content in the 
at harvest, it also had high, higher bricks at harvest, but also had a higher extor, uh, extor um, bricks. And interestingly, the, when you thin fruit to singles across the tree, it's the, although it didn't seem to have a, a significant effect at, at harvest, that did develop into more bricks um, accumulating in the fruit, developing in the fruit during during storage. So that, that's some of the work we've done on the thinning, and maybe we haven't been as successful in managing crop load to manipulate um, dramatons as we'd like to have done. Um, clearly, the early the early events um, in manipulating crop load haven't been as successful as we imagined, and it seemed to be all the later the later events that seem to be more effective in manipulating some of the carbohydrate accumulation. So this is a bit more about the work on um, improving light penetration and light interception, which was done by NIAB and was led by Julian Lacourt when he was at NIAB EMR. And this, this goes on from some of the work he carried out when he was in France previously to trying to improve the light penetration through the canopy. And this is done through a process called centrifugal pruning, where you extinguish a lot of the buds um, near the trunk, particularly on, uh, um, in the lower, lower side of the branches. And you end up leaving a, a sort of central core of light that can penetrate through the through the tr trunk into the um, <clears throat> lower, particularly the lower branches, where often we find dry matter content is, is poorer. So this was also combined with the use of a um, reflective covers, which were put in the alleyways um, as a way to, to bounce light back up into the canopy. <clears throat> and the reason for trying to improve light interception is a quite good relationship between improved light inter uh, interception with dramatic content. So this is work done at East Morning many years ago. Um, and there's also improvement in bricks and improved storage potential of that fruit. So this is a, just a picture of um, in this Morning. Uh, so this is a, one of the um, gala orchards where the canopy, the reflective cover was, was, was um, uh, uh, positioned. And this is showing you some examples of early pruned, centrifugal pruned trees. They took a number of years to come back into full full production. They were fairly hard. They were converted from tall spindle, so they had a, a fairly harsh pruning. So it's just an example of the um, effect of applying centrifugal pr uh, pruning. You can see from this graph here that we had much more light, greater light interception um, through the canopy, and this was uh, also increased when you actually had. Um, reflective covers in, in alleyways too, you bounced up more light off the ground. And what did that do to the fruit? Well, one example here is that we, the East Niab, were looking at fruit weight uh, growth, um, fruit size, and when you combine the two, the central fruit pruning and um, reflective covers, you actually increase the fruit diameter growth during that period between late July and, and harvest. So from the work we looked at in terms of how did that affect dry matter content, well, again, it's been very seasonally affected. And so what we find is that in in some years, the most biggest effect is on the lower canopy, um, certainly. So 2019 was a, a duller year, and you can see by the graph here, in the sunshine hours, it was lower than 2018 or last year. So 2017 and 2019 were low sunshine years, summers. Um, However, even in 2019, we did see a, a, a benefit of um, including um, reflective covers um, in the bottom of the canopy. And then um, also in 2020, what we found was that, um, again, reflective covers were were better by having pruning uh, Centrifugal pruning and reflective covers together increased, increased um, the dry matter content of the fruit at the bottom of the canopy by about 1%. And that's true also in, in um, 2019, but that the overall amount is less due to being a dull year. I guess this shows you the variation we found across the four years of the trials that um, we found this sort of 2017 and 2019 were duller years and we found this reduction in dramatic content uh, and proportionally bricks was also down. So what does this do to the fruits in terms of fruit quality at harvest? Then what we found was that um, by pruning the fruit, we actually, so a central fruit pruning, 
Um, we did manipulate the uh, maturity based on the internal ethylene concentration, so we reduced. We slightly delayed fruit maturity by having a central frugal, frugal pruning system. Um, we raised dry matter slightly, very slightly, about 0.4%. Um, we also, in terms of having the covers, we again, we having reflective covers, um, increased dry matter content by about 0.3%, so not, not hugely in this year, 2019. Um, but we also raised the sucrose content, so that's, that's quite important. So we actually want the sweeter, definitely sweeter. Um, but also position, as you might probably well know, that the trees at the top of the fruit uh, tree tend to be higher in dry matter content, um, they get more sunlight, clearly, uh, and that, that also raises the dry matter content by about 0.3% compared to the lower canopy. So going on to some work we also did in this project was doing some more meta-analysis, trying to look at some existing data that was out there. Um, this is actually data that FAST were generating through their commercial um, analysis of fruit for mineral analysis, but also for dry matter content. And we were able to um, take, do some uh, multivariate analysis on that, on that data to look at the, any relationship between mineral nutrient accumulation and that of dry matter. And this was done over, over data from 56 orchards over uh, three years of data, so we're very well uh, appreciative of, of FAST for giving us data. Um, and certainly there was some weak correlations. If you look at this bottom line here, when you see a, a pink box that suggests that that's a, a weak a positive relationship, and where there's a, a blue box that's a negative relationship. And so what you found with, um, with this analysis was that um, if you magnesium and potassium were there was a, a positive relationship between having more potassium and magnesium in the fruit and having greater dry matter content. And interestingly, there was a slight negative uh, relationship with zinc in the fruit. So there's, there's an interesting combination of interactions going on with nutrients and, and fruit accumulation, which might be due to the positive effects on the canopy because magnesium, fruit, uh, leaves that are particularly low in magnesium tend to um, hold on to their photosynthate and don't translocate it into the, into the into the fruit. So maybe there is a good fruit type there, but it hasn't been proven really in the experience we've done. This is just purely correlative. But again, these graphs here show you that um, by raising potassium slightly and raising magnesium, <clears throat> you're able to have a slightly, a very slight increase in dramatic content. And the only caveat here I put in is that obviously magnesium and potassium are, are antagonists of calcium. And so one needs to be minded not to go and plaster your trees and in either of these two um, nutrients because they might have a have an effect on your storage potential due to interfering with calcium and also there's an effect on, on zinc. So the last bit of the talk just going to briefly talk about is the work that Mirdad uh, and Mark Tully, Mirdad Mizzi and Mark Tully did um, and Colin Carter at, at Vans here which was trying to understand not only um, how we can actually better um, understand the maturity of, of gala at harvest so um, to, and I'll predict that change in starch content to give us an optimal um, picking date for gala because you know, gar starch um, patterns in gala change very quickly and um, it's quite important not to uh, give people as much advanced knowledge, uh, warning as they can. So this is a, 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 a machine called a, firm, uh, a um, hand EP, a hands tech machine that measures chlorophyll fluorescence and as fruits mature, the fluorescent yield decreases. And so Mirdad has been working on a model that says, shows that when this uh, decrease from, from beginning of July, um, more or less halves the actual yield, and that gives the growers about a, a seven to 10 day alert as to when to pick the fruit. And this has been used by Lancia um, with their clients to help them to, 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 to optimize uh, picking date, which is uh, sometimes better than just using starch alone because starch sometimes those starch clearance patterns happen very quickly um, in the fruit and growers don't have a great deal of time to organize picking of particular orchards. So in conclusion, dramatic accumulation um, can be manipulated by in the lower canopy by centrifugal pruning uh, and protective covers. Thinning to size seems to be the most consistent in terms of improving fruit quality. Um, early thinning events seem to actually shift fruits being larger fruits rather than manipulating dry matter content per se. And as I just mentioned, the, the chlorophyll fluorescence. Um, the chlorophyll fluorescence is a, a way of changing the monitoring fruit, um, fruit quality. I'll leave it there.
but to say thank, sort you. Of, thank you yeah. thank you richard um we have a couple of questions for Richard. Um, first of all, can Richard explain what thinning to size means? Um, uh, and the, the questioner missed that bit. And what does uh, and what disease does Brevis encourage? Is it scab? Ah, oh, good question. Um, the first one, it's it's um, thinning to size is when you there are models out there in terms of how if a fruit doesn't reach a certain size by a certain time, it won't actually reach a commercial. Um, a commercial size fruit 60 65 mil by the harvest time so there's a as an event goes on at 25 to 30 mils where um fruits that don't haven't met that sort of on that on that curve um are removed and then a second event at 40 mils um it's kind of thinning to a threshold isn't it if it's yeah. reached the threshold it gets to stay if it doesn't if it hasn't reached the threshold size it gets taken off yeah that's a good way of explaining it yeah uh, the other one, well, I don't actually know. Uh, I'd have to go back to ask um, Fast. I, I didn't. They didn't actually say what disease it was actually. So I'd have to go back and. Okay. I'm just. I'm maybe... just guessing. I'm just guessing that um, that it's uh, if that, that it's a function of the hand thinning that goes on afterwards or not. Um, and, and if you've already done a good thinning job, you tend not to do any hand thinning after, and, and so consequently you wouldn't take off anything which is a bit blemished. Don't know. We'd have to go back and ask, as you say. Yeah. Okay. I just also mentioned that it's a very bad scold year this year, and so if people just mind the growers at uh, Bramley to look out for their scold in store. Thank you for that tip. Um, and the final question, Richard, for you: Does this scientific principle you've been talking about hold true for stone fruit production as well as apples? Good question. Um, dry matter content generally is is um, related to uh, sweetness. So in kiwi, in kiwis in New Zealand, uh, the growers are paid by dry matter, dry matter content. Um, but I have we haven't worked on stone fruit, so I, I, I'd hesitate, hesitate to be too enthusiastic at this moment in time. But certainly, dry matter content is, is related to sweetness. How you get there may be another matter for each different. Um, species. Okay. Richard, we'll leave you to uh, rest. <laughs> we, we've asked you to do a lot of talking at the end of a, a long day, but thank you very much indeed for presenting to us this afternoon. Um, so uh, that sort of can, comes to the conclusion of our day. Uh, Rob, I'd like to say a huge thank you to you as well. Um, and uh, your uh, help uh, in putting everything into context has been excellent. Um, we're very, very grateful uh, to you. Um, just, just to pull everything together, really, and I hope uh, your presence has benefited everybody out there. Um, I'm just going to try and move my slides along, if I may. Um, well, while you're moving your slides, Scott, I want to say, really, sort of, on behalf of the growers, uh, a big thank you to you for uh, for pulling this all together. Um, and I know you've, you've you've played a big part, not just in not just in being compare for the day, but actually in pulling together the uh, the sequence of sequence of speakers and getting everything organised. Um, and we really, really appreciate it. That you know your your uh, your knowledge transfer activities, I think, are um, exemplary. So thank you. Well, that's very kind. It takes a team, though, and uh, you 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 help to lead all the research that we do as tree fruit panel chair. So uh, we'll uh, scratch each other's back and and uh, compliment one another. Um, we would get together for a drink if it wasn't for this wretched pandemic. Um, and one maybe uh, next time we do one of these events, we'll be back in, back all together again. But who knows? Um, thank you really to all our presenters today. Um, you've spent a huge amount of time preparing some very clever. Uh, and, and easy to understand presentations. Um, for those of you who are interested in basis points uh, and Neuroso, um, please, uh, if you haven't already submitted your uh, registration details, you can send them to maya.kotecha at ahdb.org.uk. Um, if, if you want to send them to me, you can, and I'll forward them to Maya. We will submit them for you. That was a question that we got earlier. Somebody was asking that. We will submit them. You just have to supply us with your details and your registration number and anything else like that, and we will put a form together and submit to Basis and Neuroso. Um, I, I apologize again for those of you who maybe didn't get a full and complete answer to some of your questions, particularly those towards Ralph Noble and the work he was doing on bait sprays and SWD. So um, I will 
forward we will forward those questions to Ralph and ask him to to di directly uh, answer those. Just to remind everybody that today's uh, event has been recorded. It will be made available hopefully next week on the AHDB Horticulture Events Archive page, uh, which is there. If you can't find that, just search on Google or another search engine, uh, AHDB Horticulture Events, and you will find uh, the, the series of webinars. Um, and finally, just to say, look out for future AHDB Horticulture webinars. Next week, AHDB is running a, a carbon week. Um, so that's the first week of March. And uh, at that, I, I shall be chairing a, a, a webinar on the 2nd of March, which uh, starts, I think, runs from 12 o'clock till one o'clock. Uh, that's all about fertilizers, use of fertilizers in field grown crops. So uh, tree fruit would be relevant to that uh, and uh, their impact on uh, carbon dioxide and, and how to use them uh, safely to, to, uh, to reduce um, the carbon footprint. Um, you can find more about that on the AHDB website. Um, so finally, thank you to you because uh, without an audience, we have uh, we have no event. So thank you for taking the time to register today. Thank you for taking the time to listen in and watch. We hope you've benefited. Um, the final thing I shall say is that you should receive a, a feedback form. If you have time, please do fill that in. It's always helpful to us to get your feedback as to whether we've uh, got this right or not, whether we could improve the presentations in any way, the length of it, the time of day, and so on. So please do uh, if take the take the uh, time to do that uh, and uh, I'd normally say safe journey home to everyone but uh, hopefully you're already there and uh, have a nice evening and thank you for joining us goodbye for now goodbye